This is the Power Team America podcast, and today we've got part one of our recap of the IPF Classic World Championships with experts Julian Williams and Mike Gold. This was the biggest and most exciting world championships in IPF history with 59 countries competing. It was a tough competition, but the USA won the team points on both the women and the men's side, took home the most gold medals, the most medals overall, and the best lifter, Natalie Richards. Congratulations to everyone who competed and all of the countries involved. Part one of this recap covers the major storylines, the highlights, and the controversies. Part two covers the most impressive and most slept on performances and the day-by-day recap of all 16 weight classes. Before we start, we are four weeks out from the biggest North American championships ever with 286 athletes from 14 countries headed to the Cayman Islands. Our team is stacked with superstars like Ray Williams, Claire Zai, Lane Norton, Susie Hartwig-Gary, and Steve Mann. We've got 108 Powerlifting America athletes going across all age divisions in both raw and equipped. Two weeks after that, it's a sub-junior and junior world championships in Romania, and we have a loaded team for that as well. We'll have a media team on the ground at both competitions, delivering press conferences, interviews, behind-the-scenes coverage, and more, so be sure you subscribe to our YouTube and follow us on Instagram so you don't miss any of it. If you want to get a hat or a shirt to show your love for the squad, head over to our store now. The link is below. Thank you to SBD and Alenco for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com and become a member. Now let's get to this recap of the IPF Classic World Championships. What's up? Today we're talking the Classic Open World Championships with Julia Williams and Mike Gold. This is the one we've all been waiting for. It was the biggest world championships in history. It was the most viewed. It was the most exciting. And um, yeah, so welcome, Mike and Julia. How are y'all feeling about it? Um, yeah, it was just, fun. Yeah, been back for a little bit of time now, getting uh, getting over the world's hangover. It was pretty crazy. Uh, can't wait to see it again. It was nuts. That, that's all I got to say. It was absolutely nuts. Mike, what was your kind of takeaway from the overall vibe of like after you're leaving Malta and just like hanging out, spending so much time in the warm-up room, talking with athletes, like how the athletes felt um, about the world championships? So the vibe I got, um, not just from athletes who are there, but even like, I've been, I mean, I listened to all the content, uh, Ross was discussing this, which is that a lot of the athletes said this was like the best the world's experience they've ever had in terms of just everything. Like location obviously was great. We knew it was going to be great when we knew it was in Malta. Um, the experience, the actual venue was amazing. Uh, the warm up room looked really good. The, the seating area was nice. I actually think that, um, we might need bigger venues. Like by the prime time sessions, the place was packed. Yeah. Every single, every single seat in the stands was full before, before the first lift started. They brought out more seats. Those are full. People are standing. Um, we need more seating area, but in general, like, I think it was pretty amazing. Um, most of the lifters were saying that they had a great time. And I think that, Every place in the future that Worlds is or or any big international meets should try to replicate something similar to this. I think they did an amazing job with the venue and with the whole situation. Yeah, I mean, hats off to Moro, um, who who was the meet director who or who ran it, um, who who found the venue and all that kind of stuff, and his company Madletics, their event event coordination company, and they did a fantastic job. And then also Emmanuel Schreiber, the uh, general manager of the IPF, like did a really good job of coordinating everything. And of course, everyone in the IPF were just like running a super smooth meet. It went went off without a hitch. I don't think there was like any kind of problems. From my perspective, the athletes were hyped. Like the, there was more media coverage than ever. The IPF was doing interviews. Um, there was like a bigger media crew there than ever. SPD had like a massive media team that was there. We obviously had our tiny media team with you and me and Mike Z. Um, basically like trying to rub two sticks together to create a, a pre-game show post uh, uh, pre and post game press conferences and everything that we did as well. Um, and just the response from the athletes that I saw was that it made them feel like professional athletes, you know, it made them feel like this was like a real sporting event. Like, like you would see in any of the other mainstream sports where we have like the superstar athletes. I think our athletes at this also got that superstar treatment and they got that as well at Sheffield, but this was like extended over like seven days, you know, so actually it was eight days with a day off in the middle. So it was a, just a great experience. Like the community, the camaraderie, the, the fact that the hotel had like a, a huge lobby that everyone could just come and hang out. And like it, the, the food was open super late because the sessions were getting over like crazy late at night. Like, I think it was like around 11 or midnight, the sessions would get over. We would be doing post uh, competition press conferences for like an hour afterwards. By the time I left the media room every night, it was like you on most nights when we had primetime sessions, 
I didn't leave the meeting room till like almost 2 a.m. every night. And then what was cool about it was that you could go down the street and all the restaurants were open till 5 a.m. So um, you could go out and you could still like get, find like some decent like pizza and food, uh, burgers and stuff like that. And yeah, it was awesome. It was just a great venue. You could walk about, you know, I'd say maybe it was like a five minute walk from the hotel to like a beach um, where you could go and like dip your feet in the water and stuff like that. So, I mean, just an amazing venue, like Emmanuel and Moro, like they just did a, such a good job of like finding this place, finding this location, finding this hotel. Um, it was just, it was, it had everything that you could possibly want, like grocery stores nearby. Um, the athletes basically wanted for nothing at this competition. And it was, it was, it was awesome. And I think just rumors that I'm hearing, you know, like no, nothing official is that hopefully Malta will be hosting more of the world championships in the future as well. So maybe we'll be going back to Malta. Um, were there any lessons that you learned, Mike, uh, maybe as it pertains to sunscreen? <laughs> Um, so I, I learned an important thing is um, when you drink a good amount, you should then make sure to put sunscreen on the following day before you fall asleep. <laughs> very, very important. Hopefully you have some of those uh, highlights on your Instagram story. Um, if, if you are missing, if you miss out on any of the stuff we did, we have made a highlight on our Instagram story, powerfully underscore America. It says Malta. You can go back and you can see all the cool things that we did, like all the behind the scenes, little interviews that we did in between disciplines. Um, usually, oftentimes when athletes were going to take a pee in between disciplines, it was a good time for them because the bathrooms were so far away. Like that was the only thing if you want to think about how to make the venue better. It worked out for our purposes. So we took advantage of it because we used that time to like interview the athlete when they're like walking from the warm up room to the bathrooms. Um, but yeah, if, if there was anything, it was just that the, the bathrooms were a little ways away and, um, it, it definitely made it so that we got in our steps for sure. But yeah, like some super cool stories, like you'll see, Hey Zeus, he just gets done squatting. He's about to bench. And actually Moro's kids were standing there at the entryway whenever he went out to go, go to the bathroom and come back. And Moro's kids are asking like, can I get a selfie with you? Hey Zeus. And, and they didn't know that he was in the middle of a session that he just got done squatting. And hey, Zeus had just told me before that, like, don't let anyone take selfies with me and stuff. He's like, because like the pace of the competition was so fast. So we wanted to get him back in there and get him benching as quick as possible. And he had just told me, like, don't let anyone like take selfies with me or anything like that. Be my bodyguard. And I was like, I was like, no, sorry, no, no pictures, no selfies. And he's like, he's like, no, it's okay. I'll do it for the kids. You know, and anyway, you see that story is out there on our Instagram stories. It's under that highlight that says Malta on our on our profile there. Um, but yeah, it was, there's tons of like awesome little things like that, that happen. Uh, we try to document everything. We try to keep it all on our Instagram stories. So definitely check that out. Um, we also did 16 pre-competition press conferences, 15 post-competition press conferences, seven pre-game shows, all live, all with basically myself and Mike Gold, a couple other guest stars like Heather Connor and Delaney Wallace on the pre-game shows. Um, all of that's out there on our YouTube channel. So definitely go take a look at all of that kind of stuff. We're going to keep pumping out more of it. Little highlights from the press conferences. We've got more of those coming. Um, the high, high def versions of the press conferences. We're going to post all those individually on YouTube as well. So definitely stay tuned over there and check it out. But yeah, Mike, just being there in person again, like, um, overall, I think the takeaway for me was just like, wow, like this, this was a real event. Like this felt like going to like a football game or something like that, you know, and the athletes, they, they definitely felt like this was like a serious world championship. That was a step above any of the previous ones that they had been to. Yeah. I would say one thing, um, I've never been before this to an open world championship, but one thing that from what I've heard in the past that differed here is that. People said that like IPF Worlds is one of these meets that's like a library. Like it's a quiet meet. It's, they're trying everything being so professional. So here, I mean, they tried to make it professional mostly. I mean, it would help if they knew how to spell powerlifting, but that's story for another day. Burn. But um, but it wasn't like it wasn't quiet. I mean, from the first session, from the first session, which the first session wasn't even a prime time session. It was early Sunday morning, first day of Worlds. Most probably half the athletes are not even there yet. And still the, the noise was coming, like the crowds were filling up. It wasn't as packed necessarily as it was later, but it was still pretty full. Um, plenty of fans there, plenty of athletes in the stands, making noise, being hyped. Like from the start, like it was a loud meet. 
it was like people were enjoying it and people were making themselves hurt from all the different countries. Yeah, I mean, some countries were certainly louder than others. Some had like bigger contingencies, like Team France was super loud and like super into it. Sweden was really big too in the crowd. They were going crazy for all their sessions. But like, as you mentioned, it was standing room only. They actually, Moro and his team actually brought in more seating. Like they brought in like a little like mini stages that they had set up on the uh, on the sides of the main stands that they had and put chairs in those so that people could see over all the media and camera crew and stuff like this. Like they just did such a good job. Like they're just like pulling out all the stops. Like one day I walk out there and I'm just like, holy cow, there's like all this additional seating now. And then it was all full. Like it was completely full every time. So um, it was, it was just awesome. Like there's, there's no other way to put it. Julia, were you at home or, or Mike, did you have something you want to add? Yeah. I would say if there's one thing they could add with the seating, is make some VIP tables. You could buy a VIP table, you get drinks served to you, you get your seats, you don't need to worry about anyone coming and taking them. Yeah. I think that would be, that would be a fun. That's a good, that's a, a good money-making idea for me directors out there is like make a VIP table again. Yeah. So that you could have your seats reserved so that you don't have to show up like an hour before the session starts just to save a seat, which that's what people were doing. It was crazy. Like people were actually in the crowd. Were there, were people drinking in there very much? I, I, I couldn't really recall like seeing too many. People. There were some, there were clearly some. I mean, so they, you were, could have, they were selling drinks in the back. They were selling drinks in the back. Okay, yeah. cool. And you could just have beers and stuff. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, it's in the hotel. So like, of course you could, you know, bring in a beer or whatever, just like you would um, at any other type of hotel, but cool. That's exciting. Julia, what, what were you thinking? Like from home, like, were you just wishing that you were there? Were you having FOMO like crazy? Um, or, you know, what was the, did you get a sense of this kind of stuff we're talking about at home, like watching just on social media and on the live stream and whatnot? Yeah. So, um, I saw kind of, I, I did see the crowd quite a bit and I could hear them. Um, and it, it reminded me, I mean, not completely of Sheffield, but, but, you know, somewhat close, closer to Sheffield than, you know, you would expect for, for, um, IPF worlds, which is traditionally very quiet. Um, there were definitely some, uh, rowdy characters in the audience sometimes. Um, yeah, it, it looked really fun, looked really fun to watch. Um, and yeah, I would say that I think that it's going to set a precedent for future worlds because I don't think after this, we're going to go back to, you know, the quiet, like nobody in the stands, um, no, no media attention um, thing because everyone loved this. And I think it probably made more money for the hosts. Um, I think, you know, the athletes liked it a lot more. I see, you know, people watching the videos over and over again. Um, one of the, the athletes uh, who's going to sub juniors actually said she played uh, one of the videos of one of the guys deadlifting as motivation you know so people are starting to like use see see the competition see worlds in a different way and so i think that it was really really cool and yeah i think this is the future for sure i mean the media attention the media coverage of it was like it's never been done before um at his post competition press conference delaney wallace like specifically mentioned that the worlds in South Africa was quiet and in comparison to this. And he said, you get here and you could just hear the crowd and it was, they're cheering for you. And he's like, you feed off that energy. And just as an athlete, I just think it's one of these things where like our athletes, we see them as stars. Like we have so much respect for what they're doing on the platform, like moving around these weights that are like insane numbers. And, and so I think it's just cool to finally give them a platform and give them a stage where they can shine and be stars. Like we all see them as stars. It's fine. It's cool to finally see them like kind of getting that recognition and getting treated like stars. And hopefully with this kind of promotion and stuff like this, sponsors will also come in and start treating them like stars as well. You know, like we're going to see Jesus on like a subway ad with Patrick Mahomes one day. Um, that would be, that would be freaking awesome, you know? Um, and, you know, get like that Mercedes sponsorship and the Amazon world web services sponsorships and things like this that you see in other major sports. So, but yeah. All right. Any other like overall general reaction stuff you guys want, or you want to get into this? Um, we could get into the actual, unless. I just wanted to say, I thought the architecture was, really cool um like just the, in malta yeah the flyovers of like the um what you could see of the the venue and the the 
city. Um, it just, it looked like nothing uh, I've ever seen before. So. Yeah, I mean, it, Malta was a star in itself. Like we're talking about our star athletes, but Malta itself is just like, it's a great place to go. Um, it was super easy to get around. Like everything was like pretty affordable, not, not super cheap, but not super expensive either. Um, restaurants open super late, amazing pizza. Like, like the pizza was just like, it's like Italian pizza, you know? So it's like super good, great food. The people were nice great weather, um, awesome, like beaches and swimming places and cruises. And like Mike took the, the catamaran cruise and it got completely roasted <laughs> sunburn. Um, yeah. And like a lot of people, that was a cool thing was like, we saw a lot of the athletes, they would compete and then they would go out and do this kind of stuff, like do cruises, like go to the blue lagoon, like go take a tour of Valletta, which is like a really historical area, go to other historical parts. A lot of people did extended stays and vacations. It's close to Egypt. It's close to um, Italy, obviously. So a ton of people went to Italy. I know that Jessica Espinal like just got back. Um, I know Amanda just got back from like a really long cruise, but Jessica Espinal went to like Egypt. She went to Jordan. Like she saw Petra, like she saw a lot of awesome stuff, like in a, in a short period of time, I stayed for like five days afterwards and just was like swimming and eating, eating my weight and pizza and stuff like this every day. So like, it was, it was super cool. Definitely Malta. It was a great location for our first world, like open world championship. I've never been to any other um, worlds before. I went to NAPFs in Panama. Panama city was awesome too. Last year. Like that was, that was also a really good city for hosting uh, world championships. I know Mike, you went to Turkey last year. How was that in comparison? Wasn't even a comparison. <laughs> <laughs> Loaded after, question. No, no, you, after, after going to worlds in Malta, you, I don't know where you can step up from there, but you can't go down. Like, I mean, Turkey, like you're in the middle of nowhere. You're 45 minutes. We were literally 45 minutes away from like civilization. From Istanbul. Like, from the, you were, you were yeah, from anywhere. Istanbul, from any, you were city, from any city. Yeah. From any city. You're literally in the middle of nowhere. Like there's a couple of tiny shops, but I mean, just being in an area where you're so close to everything, you're anything you want to buy food wise, drinking wise, um, like doing things like activities, everything's right there. And then, so most of it's been walking distance and everything's right there. Going somewhere where like you're in the middle of nowhere, I, it's a huge step down. Like, I mean, I would love to have um, worlds be in the US at some point again, but if it is like, it would be tough. Like you have to find a city that's like something like this. Like you can't just do it in some, in the middle of like Nebraska. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Well, that like, would work. Gotta, like the middle of Texas wouldn't work for instance. The middle of Texas, yeah. I mean, I think Austin's used up, but I'm saying, like, if you did it in Vegas or something like that, that would be like the semi-comparable thing, or like in in Daytona or something like that. Yeah, but, it would just be like so much more expensive in Vegas or like in New York City. Like if, like I know oh, Delaney no, talked fast. about having it, you know, like Madison Square Garden. You know, it's just it would be so expensive in comparison. I, I think Malta's. The, Moro is going to start hosting a world championship every year. I think like the, it was so popular. He did such a good job. I think we'll, I think the IPF will be in Malta damn near every year going, going forward, just because of how good of a job he did. But yeah. All right. Let's get into some of the analysis. Uh, what was the biggest thing that happened at the world championships in your opinion? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be like a specific performance or a specific athlete or anything like that, but just like, off the top of your head, what was like the biggest thing that happened? And we'll go to Mike first. So honestly, I'm going to pick a loaded one because it's one storyline that has like multiple storylines within. So I would say um, in general, the um, super heavy woman. So let's start with one thing, right? So coming in, we had Bonica, 11 uh, time world champion, um, the GOAT. She was nominated first, but there were people like that were getting closer and it was supposed to be the best um, 84 plus battle that we've had. But even so, like it wasn't necessarily the most hyped up weight class. So that was the start. Now, this ended up being craziness. So first off, I mean, it started off nuts. We had the world record squat being broken like five times. And we saw from like literally even just from when um, openers were announced that this was going to be crazy. Yeah. And then um, – but the biggest aspect of the storyline is Bonica bombing out. Um, I think almost everybody probably thought she was going to win, myself included. Um, 
And even the people that didn't think she was going to win, that, for whatever reason, they probably had some specific lifter that they thought was like uh, building up something crazy. But I don't think anyone expected a bomb out. And whenever this, whenever there's a bomb out at the World Championships, it's going to be big news. But we're not talking about a bomb out from the number five lifter or even from like the closely uh, contested number one lifter. We're talking about the, the lifter who has been at the top every single year. So to me, that that is the biggest thing that happened in the world championships. Um, and just digging into it. Um, so she mentioned this in her uh, post worlds um, interview that one of the things she was upset about was just the pace of the meet, which I think is that's part of this storyline and part of the storyline in general, which is that we had for prime time for anybody who, who didn't necessarily watch it or wasn't paying close attention, we would have. Uh, our primetime sessions would have two flights of eight lifters. So you would literally have like six to eight minutes between attempts. And then not so long, even in between squat bench, the sessions would end in two hours. I mean, all, all you like go to the, do your SBD day in the gym for four hours. No, we're talking about like two hours total, like the session moved and that's difficult for anyone, but um, like especially 25 for, minutes like, to get warmed up for your next event. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's no like you finish squats and now you can go chill for 20 minutes and eat. No, you finish squats, you take off your equipment, you, you maybe grab a bite to eat, and then you start warming up for bench. Like that's what it was like. Um, and while this would affect anyone, it, it affects the supers obviously a lot more as two reasons. Number one is they're pushing much bigger weight and they're just bigger people who take probably take longer in training and take a little time to get their like to get unwinded and whatever. So I think – um, I mean, I don't even know in general at, in the previous years if they're always done this uh, flight of eight. I know it was being discussed that one of the reasons they were doing that is because it was getting broadcasted on Eurosport. Yeah. And they wanted it to go quicker because, which makes sense for, for a viewing audience, right? We're trying to keep as many people watching and having long breaks and whatever just is worse for the viewer's experience. But I mean, I think this might be a good thing for the sport. I don't, I'm not saying personally that eight, eight lifter flights is bad, especially because when you're talking about the prime time, you're talking about the best of the best. And the bottom line is in most cases that doesn't go 10, 12 deep, like even eight, you're probably not having eight who are like battling for the podium in most classes. So I think having the best of the best is great for the viewing experience. And while it hurts some of the lifters, I think that's just another variable right? We always say, you listen to any big coach, anybody says, Worlds is not a PR day. You don't go and try to hit PRs. You go and try to win. And you got to control a lot of variables. You, you're traveling overseas, which theoretically, if done right, won't hurt you. But you have that's a variable you got to control. You're lifting a uh, different time zone. So you have to get, if you're used to, you normally lift at this time. Now it's, it's six hour time difference and not just six hour time difference, it's also just, it could be a totally different time you're lifting. Like some people lift at this time. I mean, some, it was like 7 p.m., 8, 7 or 8 p.m. for the primetime sessions, like every night. Right. Like, and especially rare. I think for most athletes are used to competing like earlier in the morning um, in powerlifting, uh, in powerlifting competitions, even in primetime, usually there it's going to be earlier than that. It's not going to be 7 or 8 p.m. start time. That's pretty late. And especially for lifters that are like cutting weight, that, that means like, if you if you're lifting at like let's say noon right and you cut weight so you okay you don't eat you wake up and you don't eat for a couple hours here like if you're cutting weight like you might not be really eating most of the day which I mean I assume most lifters are not going in for their big sessions without having eaten all day yeah right? I would hope not so it's just another variable that you have to control and just another another thing that makes it difficult so I I'm not saying I have an opinion either way on whether eight lifters is good or bad but it's definitely something that is a topic for discussion. And I just think that, that entire class was a topic for discussion. Eight, eight, uh, eight lifter flights, uh, the best lifter in the world bombing out. And then uh, to be a little controversial, the bomb out was bad, right? Whether we'll get to later other aspects of it. But even if she hadn't bombed out, what's so crazy is that with the performances put up, there's it's very likely she still went out of one, which is pretty crazy to say. So yeah. I just think that 
that that in general, that class and all the storylines around it were probably the biggest thing that happened at the World Championships. Well, and then like just to like play counterpoint to your argument about it being a related, her, the bomb out, like she said, she in her post competition press conference went on and on about it being related to how fast it went and just, you know, as well as other issues that she has with the jury and whatnot. But a big part of it was the speed of the competition was getting to her um, and that it was too fast of a turnaround and it wasn't for the lifter. It was like for the ratings on television and whatnot. But in her own same session, in the same exact session, we have Brittany Schlater go nine for nine, doesn't miss a lift and breaks the world record, the total world record by a lot, puts up 693.5, which I believe the world record total before this was 680 coming in. Is that right? So put yeah. 13 and a half kilos on the world record and goes nine for nine. And I, I don't even know if she got any red lights. I, I don't want to say she got 27 white lights, but it was something like a really, really well done performance in the exact same session. So, I mean, when it kind of takes away some of those excuses, it kind of makes them seem more like excuses than real problems. When someone in your own session that you're saying is going extremely fast, goes nine for nine, breaks a world record total by 13 kilos, has herself a hell of a day. Um, and you know, I mean, it, it kind of like says like, maybe it wasn't the refing, maybe it was on the athlete to be more prepared for, I mean, we knew this was going to be eight and eight for a long time coming into this. Like they announced that it was going to be eight and eight, like at least over a month out for sure. Right. So, and we already knew it, it coming into this as well from the previous, you asked about previous world championships. Yeah, they did. They did do something similar, very similar to this at the, in South Africa, where it was very fast. And I remember all the athletes talking about it after South Africa, that it was very fast. And I remember all of them talking about it in Sweden, that it was very fast. It's always fast at the IPF World Championships if you're in the primetime session. Like, that's just the way that it's always going to be. It's never going to be a super long, drawn out thing. Now, maybe it won't be eight and eight going forward. There were a lot of athletes that complained about being gassed. And there is a question about uh, whether you know, people want to see something, uh, an event that's going really fast, or if they want to see really big weights moved, right? Because there's no question, like when we talked to Jesus about it, he was like, the pace of this, the way it's moving, it's just not worth it for me to come out for a third squat. Like I, if I could possibly injure myself, like, like, unless everything was going absolutely flawlessly perfect on the day, he wasn't going to come out and try and push his world record on the squat. He wasn't going to tr try and push Ray Williams world record on the squat or even try to like just put on a huge show and like have a third attempt that was like whatever, 1,010 pounds or whatever. It was something, uh, multiple squats over 1,000 pounds. Wasn't worth it for him with the pace of the competition. So if you slowed it down a little bit, if it was a 10 lifter flight, maybe Jesus comes out for his third. You get the audience on TV and in person gets to see 2,000 pound squats. Is that better or is it better to have it done in two and a half hours? I don't know. It's a trade off. That's the, we're, it's above our pay grade, but these are the things that they have to think I about. Actually, I heard one, I don't remember who said it, so I can't give them credit, but I remember hearing somebody mention this point, which is interesting, which is if you cut one male and one female lifter out and you make it seven and seven, you can do one flight of 14 instead. Yeah. So then Jesus and, would have 14 minutes in between his right. thousand squats instead it, of it'll go, seven. It won't go any slower because, yeah, you have more lifters, but you only have one flight instead of two. But then it gives the lifters that, that extra five minutes, which is pretty big, especially yeah. with some of these new classes. So especially I don't know. It reared its head, head as the competition went on. Like Obviously, as you get into the heavier weight classes, like this is where you're going to see it more. Julia, what were you going to say? Yeah, um, I think another thing that Bonnie you mentioned, and I think a few other um, lifters mentioned might have been Jesus, I'm not sure, um, was the the heat in addition to the um, the pace. I think, you know, the pace is probably fine and people can adjust to that. Um, and, you know, there isn't much that you can do about the heat in, in a situation like this. So, you know, no it's no comment on the, on how the meat was run. It, it's just, you know, a fact of the matter. Um, and that's not always something that is known or can be prepared for. Um, and that can affect people quite a bit. Um, again, you know, like you said, it's not really, um, there's not really strong evidence for it being, you know, something that people can't overcome when people are going nine for nine and hitting PRs and all of that. But um, just something to mention that, you know, 
when you have the pace and um, temperatures that might not be ideal, that can really change things, whether it's hot or cold. You know, I've been in, I've been in situations where um, the warm room of the venue was very cold and that affected yeah. people, you know. So um, I just, Last you know. Year in South Africa, it was winter in South Africa and, and everyone was saying how it was so cold in there and the warm up rooms were super cold, everything was cold. Um, definitely you saw like Mike, I was in the warm up room a lot and, and you were out on the platform a lot, um, running a camera out there for us. Thank you for doing that, man. Um, he came through clutch with the camera skills. Um, but the, in the warm up room, you know, um, they were like fanning a, a lot of, a lot of like the handlers and stuff were like fanning their athletes and stuff. I don't really feel like it was hot. I mean, in comparison to Turkey last year, it sounds like it was a cakewalk. Yeah, right, uh, I'll be honest. Um, until Julie just mentioned this now, I didn't even notice it was hot. As far as I get hot pretty easily, I, I didn't think it was hot. Um, Turkey, yeah, that was a disaster. There was one tiny AC unit for a massive room, and it, they were like five people per platform. I'm supposed to hear where it was like one. But I don't know. I, I didn't notice it. I'm not saying it wasn't hot. Maybe it was. I wasn't. I didn't spend as much time in the warm-up room. But again, these are all variables that harder, some are harder or easier to control. But the bottom line is, especially when you're seeing other people put up the best performance of their lives, it's doable. And while, listen, when people have bad days, it's first thing to think of other reasons other than yourself of why that happened. But the bottom line is, it's doable. Other people are doing it. It still might be annoying. It still is annoying, but you got to adapt. That's it. Yeah. End of story. Yeah, for sure. And um, I mean, you want to tell us the rest of what happened in that class? So should well, we we'll get into this now? So yeah, so class started off crazy. Uh, squat record got thrown around, literally thrown around. Um, we get into bench. It's it's close. Um, at the top, there's three. It's a three way battle between Bonica. Uh, Brittany and Sona or Sonita. I don't know which ones she prefers. Um, bench went, nothing much changed. Um, nobody put like a huge gap on bench. Then it comes into deadlifts and we have three people nominated, um, three people whose openers on deadlifts will put them in within like 10 kilos. And that's when the first um, potentially huge mistake happens, which is... Um, Bonica raised her deadlift opener by five kilos. So uh, she explained later that she thought she might need it. So she went heavier. Uh, I've seen people discussing this and basically picking it apart, which I actually agree with them, which is your deadlift opener is irrelevant. They're, the only time your deadlift opener matters is in terms of, let's say you want to make sure that you're still in first after your openers. This way you can set the tone for each other lift. But guess what? She still would have been in first, even with the five kilos lighter on her opener. So all raising a deadlift opener does is now put you at a heavier deadlift opener, which um, I I might be wrong about this, but I think it's the heaviest deadlift opener she's ever done, which is not, that in itself is not necessarily crazy. Uh, she doesn't post much of her training, so we don't know exactly how training was going. Maybe it was going really well. We don't know. But taking those extra five kilos is going to make it more difficult. And especially in a scenario where she even mentioned beforehand that uh, the jury and her have uh, some beef and uh, the way her deadlift is, is regard, even when it's light, it's a deadlift that is always going to have, it's always going to get a second look, right? It's not necessarily bad, good. I'm not saying whether the judges were right, wrong, but it's a deadlift that just the way being a bigger lifter and that style deadlift it never looks super clean. Now, not looking clean doesn't make it a bad lift, but it does make it where you're going to get extra, extra like uh, analysis. People are going to be looking a little bit harder. So that was when the controversy started. Now, she missed her uh, opening deadlift, uh, didn't even go to the jury. Um, then uh, Sona and Brittany both smoked their deadlift openers. Now, again, the second attempts and now, Bonica is forced to retake her opener, which already, now, even if she hit it, she would already be down into third place. And she took it, 
She got, she was the first of these lifters to deadlift. She got two whites and then the jury overturned it. Now, this is one of the, one of the most controversial of the many controversial calls from the week. Personally, I thought it was a good lift, but it wasn't, it wasn't fully clear. I mean, it was up to some interpretation and as much as I hate the jury overturning things, um, anytime you get only two whites, you are putting yourself at potential risk. Getting through, you get through whites, it's over. No matter, even if it was a mistake, uh, there were lifts, other lifts in other sessions that got three whites and uh, the jury slash Gaston were not happy about it. But guess what? You get three whites, doesn't matter. So she got her two whites, the jury overturned it. Uh, the other lifters both hit their seconds. And at this point, she had, it was impossible for her to win regardless. Comes into her third deadlifts and she now switches it up and switches to conventional. Um, uh, I don't know the last time she's pulled conventional in the competition, but I guess she thought maybe maybe her lockout would be potentially a little bit more clear here. Yeah, I think she, she pulled conventional at the last world championships and then pulled sumo at the world games last year. So she does do both. Right. Um, it's right. not no, no, I know she trains far. both. But, um, yeah. She definitely did two more at World Games and at Sheffield. Um, so she pulls conventional here. She yeah. gets it up like towards her legs, but she doesn't even really come close to fully locking that one out. So that one was that was a wrap. And then she also put on like her some different shoes. They looked like they were her squat shoes. Oh, yeah, she put on heels. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know. I don't really understand it. Um, obviously she has some sort of reasoning and she said it didn't really make sense to me, but she tried, I mean, whatever, at that point, it's at that point, winning is already off the table. All there's left is trying to save the meat and save also by saving the meat, saving your squat record, because if you bum out, you no longer keep your squat record. So she'll do whatever she takes, whatever it takes. And I guess at that point, even though she presumably is stronger sumo, she thought that if, I guess she assumed that her second deadlift was as clean as she can get it sumo. So she didn't, if she thought if that's not going to get called as a good lift, then there's nothing she could really do. Yeah. So she's like, try something else and it didn't work out. So it was, I mean, it was pretty crazy. We'll go over a little bit more details uh, when we go through our class by class um, breakdown, but overall that was, yeah. That was definitely like one of the biggest things that happened at the world championships. I mean, there's no question about it. I had people talking for days afterwards. There was so much, it tied in with so many of the storylines. Like you said, the speed of the competition jury overturns were a big story throughout. Um, and then, you know, like even like the heat and stuff that you were talking about, I think it was just the humidity in general in Malta was, was high. It's like right on the ocean. So it, maybe it was the humidity that was getting people a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was definitely one of the biggest things that happened. Julia, did you have any final thoughts on that or anything that Mike said there touch a nerve? What did you think about um, her, her third, her second attempt that Mike thought was good watching it on the live stream? Yeah. I mean, I thought, you know, worlds um, there's very strict judging. Um, I think it could have gone either way. Um, what, kind of annoyed me about it being overturned more so than I thought, you know, it was for sure a good lift because I did think, you know, it, 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 again, that it could have gone either way was that there were other deadlifts that were passed in that session with three white lights, I think. So, you know, there was no chance for the jury to overturn them that were of similar caliber. Um, and so to me that, you know, she missed her first she got this one and then it was overturned and then seeing other lifts in that session get three white lights that, that were also questionable. Um, I just don't think that it's so good when, um, and maybe we'll touch on this later, um, when the jury is, has a very active role in deciding the outcome of the meet. Um, and again, like I'm not, you know, condoning any behavior that might have taken place or, you know, anything like that. But it's just a fact of the matter that that is what happened. And um, yeah, just to, to be blunt, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think about the strategy of like bumping up her deadlift opener? 
you know, I think she she did say something about the pace being fast. And again, I think she was one of the athletes that mentioned the heat. And, you know, in that situation, I don't think it's smart to bump up your opener. I think um, that that was probably a mistake. Um, I understand, you know, like you're in a heated battle with, you know, two very, very strong competitors. But um, yeah, I mean, you have to play your own game at a certain point you have to get a lift in for um for you to get a total for you to win you have to get a lift in you know so if you can't get a lift in then you know there's no point in trying to like play to someone else's game yeah i just think like that just doesn't really add up to me like you're you're gassed you're you're hot you're the meat's moving fast um you know you have trouble with the jury in the past you've your, your deadlift is, is on that edge of like, where there's always going to be extra scrutiny. And especially like, like she was saying with like certain members of the jury and whatnot, to me, I mean, it, all of that stuff points to opening lighter rather than heavier, like get one in that's undeniable, right? Like get it in and just get that squat record. And then it puts pressure on the other women too, because like when you miss your opener, all of a sudden those two other ladies just like a weight is lifted off their shoulders. They're just sitting here thinking, wow, like she could bomb out or if nothing else, she's definitely not going to get to her top end deadlift. So you're not putting any pressure. You know, if you come out and you make that opener, all of a sudden they might not know, oh, maybe she's going to take a big jump. Maybe she's not. They don't know. It just puts it in their mind of like, hey, we have to perform perfectly in order to win this. Now, I don't think Brittany Schlater was going to get phased or have any kind of pressure get to her. Like she, she was immaculate on the whole day. But you just never know if circumstances are different. Bonica takes 135 and smokes it. And it, I mean, honestly, both of those first two attempts with 240, she blew them up fast. I mean, like neither strength was not a problem with either of them by any means. They looked like openers. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just all the things that she was talking and all the indications point to just keep it at 235 or even think about lowering it or something just to guarantee you get one on the board. What do you think, Mike? So while I fully agree and I, I disagree with uh, Bonica's approach, I get the feeling that she's one of these lifters that to her, it's winning or nothing. Yeah. And yeah. that there's no playing it safe because she doesn't care. That th This is an impression. I don't actually know this, but yeah. that's the feeling I get. And therefore, as much as I think it was a bad decision to bump it up, and I actually agree with you that if anything dropped down a little bit because the bottom line is – you can always take the deadlift jumps if necessary. In fact, all it's going to do is have you a little bit fresher. You need to hit three deadlifts either way to win. So, yeah, I think it was a mistake. And, and Julie, honestly, you... one other thing uh, I, was, I did, forgot to mention earlier. I didn't know if I should bring it up or not, but I decided why not because I don't care. Which is uh, people were discussing uh, Bonica's a little bit what she was saying after this happened. Uh, calling out the jury, this, that, asking if she has to go to awards. And um, I actually, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm going to quote uh, Russell Ori. He mentioned this on his podcast and he said a line that I really like. So he said, a lot of people are giving her hate, right? And he said, personally, he's with her totally. Like he does not think it's a bad look. I mean, it might be a bad look with it, that there's anything wrong. He said, show me, show me a, a gracious loser and I'll show you a loser. That was uh -huh. not like uh -huh. if when you're when you're like obviously after it's over or whatever you should go congratulate your op op uh, opponent this that but the bottom line is if you're a real athlete and you have that competitive if you got that mob of mentality you don't want to lose and there's no when you lose like okay eventually the bottom line is you you gotta you gotta act whatever in a certain way but initially right away like your first reaction I don't think that expectation is to be super gracious if somebody's if you're in the super bowl right and you're down three points and you're driving last drive and the quarterback throws a pick to end the game uh he has he's forced to do his post game interview either way because i mean that's how it works yeah but, uh, you shouldn't expect him to be like oh yeah it was it was it was great uh they just outplayed us no he's gonna be upset yeah as he should and if he wasn't upset then me as a fan i would be upset so that's just my personal take. Yeah, you like the fire in Monica for sure. Like, like whether yeah. or not specifics of the details of the activities 
you know, you know, you don't want to condone. I mean, you always want someone to be a good sport afterwards. Like that's a, that's a big thing in sports as well. Like uh, a lot of sports, it's like, Hey, you still gotta, you know, shake hands afterwards and say good job, but you don't have to be happy about it. Like that's, that's the thing. Um, so, um, Julia, what, what's your final thoughts on the Bonica bomb out? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, she was saying before that, um, these two people were on the jury that overturned her deadlift at world games, which, you know, I, I might have some feelings about that. Putting them on the jury for her specific flight again is, um, you, you know, like there's, there's obviously some bias and some contention there. And I, I don't know if that's, you know, like the best call, um, but it is what it is. And I think it got in her head a little bit, um, you know, and I, I don't think that she is necessarily wrong factually um, about um, the some calls being controversial. Um, but, you know, and, and saying what you want in the press conference is one thing, but I I don't think it's very respectful to like, you know, be on your phone during the award ceremony or anything like that. Um, but I do think, you know, people are complaining about, you know, what she said on Instagram and um, what she said in the press conference. And I, I don't agree with the people who are critical about her um, behavior there, because I think that she made a very good point, which is that if you don't speak up about things, they won't change. Um, and, you know, as an athlete, you should express your opinion about things. Um, and you should be heard. Um, I might have expressed it a little differently and used different words, but you know, in essence, she's right about that. I just don't think that it was very respectful to be on her phone um, at the award ceremony. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's certainly something about like, um, you know, just the, circ the the ceremonial nature of awards and whatnot. And like, not it's not about you. You're not going to be on the podium. So like, don't try to draw attention to yourself, things like this. But again, I like the attitude. I do like the fiery competitor in her. I like the fact that she's not here to make friends. Um, like, I like that. I mean, like, like, like Mike said, like if she were a football team, that's exactly what you would expect. Like, like that would, that's what you would expect from like, a winning team, you know, that hates to lose and will do anything it takes to win. Um, and they're not, they're, they're not going to be friends with their opponents and stuff like this off the court. So I, I think it's really cool. I mean, it's controversy, but this is what we have. Like we have, we have personalities, we have stars, right? Like stars are going to do their star thing. Like some stars are going to act up and, and the fans aren't going to like them. And they're going to think like, Oh, they're a show off or, Oh, they're too, too cocky or whatever it is. Like, good. I'm glad we have that. I'm glad that people have opinions about her. You know what I'm saying? Like it's better to have opinions than to just think that it's like some vanilla middle of the road that you have, it doesn't elicit any emotional reaction whatsoever from the crowd or from the fans, whether you like her or dislike her, you know, so I'm, I'm all for it. Certainly um, there's a code of conduct and whatnot, as far as like what you're supposed to do on the platform. And as far as, you know, at the award ceremony, that's something for sure. But, um, but yeah, overall, I kind of like the general attitude. But all right, damn, we have talked about Bonica. <laughs> and this must have been the biggest thing that happened because we talked about it for a long time. So let's run through some other um, biggest things that happened at the World Championship. Julia, what's your biggest thing? So before we before we started this whole thing talking about Bonica, um, I just asked you all to think of like off the top of your head, like what's the biggest thing that happened at the World Championships in your opinion? It could be anything. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, this one is also a bit of a bummer for uh, Team USA, but um, I think I would go with um, Taylor uh, getting knocked off the top spot in the 74s. Um, you know, the way that Taylor is thought of um, in powerlifting is like, you know, he's he's kind of one of these these last ones that like, you know, can't be beat. And, you know, he has this untouchable record that, you know, obviously he hasn't touched in a while either. Um, but he's injured. He has, you know, other priorities, like he said on King of the Lifts. And people are starting to think that it was their time. Um, again, I think that... Um, you know, the jury played a, a sizable role in this one, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, 
he went up against two competitors that were, you know, at his level and um, he had to hit all his lifts and he didn't. And, um, you know, maybe this is the end of the Atwood era. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I mean, I think personally, like, you know, he has been injured and he's going to come back um, and I would never, ever count him out. But um, nonetheless, it was exciting. And um, the lifter who won, you know, is actually a junior lifter. Um, which adds even more to this dynamic of is this, you know, the changing of the guard uh, type thing um, that a lot of people are talking about. So that would be my pick. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about there. And um, I think that that one, that one's going to be talked about, not just for, you know, a few months, but I think that this is going to be talked about, you know, right up until next year. And depending on what happens at Worlds next year after that, as you know, maybe a turning point in um the history of powerlifting so certainly it's certainly a speed bump in the road it's a it's a, a negative mark on taylor's resume um for sure like losing the world title that has got to feel terrible for him um mike what's your take on this so i think this is interesting i think this is definitely one of the biggest things that happened in the world um so i would say just to give a little background this class, this 74, 75 kilo class has been one of the most uh, talked about classes the last few years. And it hasn't been because of competition, because Taylor's been runaway. Uh, starting a few years ago, there was a, a big podcast with the 474s at the time, Taylor, Austin, Michael C., and Ricky Cho, where they were like trash talking back and forth. At that point, they were all racing to be the first person to hit 800 kilos. Um, Taylor ended up doing that shortly after Austin Perkins also did, but that's like when the controversy started kind of, but then after all that talk, uh, came Daytona nationals where Taylor said, you guys think you're close, but you don't even know. And he put up the greatest performance in the history that at least at the time in the history of tested powerlifting for sure. He totaled 838 at 74. He deadlifted 750, which is ridiculous squatted uh 668 and benched 430 um i got to see that from the front row that was also fun and he just basically he ended he ended all the talks right at the time he had he had he had still been winning prior he had won he had already won a couple of worlds and he had won nationals like the previous like six years or previous five years but uh people thought they were getting close and he had that competition that he literally his best meet ever by a mile destroyed the competition destroyed what anyone thought was possible and at that point people started calling him the goat yeah and since then um it's been a little bit more interesting since then he's not come close to um matching that performance now that's for multiple reasons so in previous in the last couple of worlds he didn't need to he was number one in the IPF by a mile, uh, his close competition, probably his probable closest competition wasn't competing in the IPF at the time. He could coast and win on literally definitely second attempts, uh, potentially openers, uh, the year that he wasn't there because of the whole split. Um, the winner totaled like 55 kilos less than he did. Like it wasn't close. Mm -hmm. Um, then he got injured or whatever. He's been injured back and forth, but he, um, got injured and coming to Sheffield before anyone knew anything about injury, he was the big favor just by the fact that the world record was really low compared to what he had done in other performances. And he came in, he was hurt. He didn't even break his own world record. And this started the talk after, especially after not really repeating that performance of is Taylor on the downhill? What's going on now? This is split between everyone. I mean, some people just think, okay, he's hurt. Some people actually think he's on the way down. Some people think that was a one one hit wonder. And like, obviously he's a great lifter still, but that he wasn't coming close to that again. Then uh, only a 12 week turnaround to Worlds. And he said he was feeling healthier. Uh, training was going better. And it was yeah. like, I, I, I see his training. I'm, I train with him. Um, but even so, nobody was expecting him to be like, peak peak Taylor, right? Realistically, 12 weeks from another competition where you're hurt. 
So this seemed to be the first 74 battle in a while. And there were a number of competitors that were going to be relevant. Um, me, myself, um, I am friends with Cali. Um, I met him in Turkey. He's a good dude. Um, I saw his training and he was coming in really strong. And then um, Tim Managati, he dropped down a weight class and he was also coming in looking really strong. There's obviously Shell, uh, former world champion. He's beaten Taylor before. Um, he was there and it was going to be a good battle, but it kind of predicated on Taylor not being 100%. Definitely. So, and then like, even so, right, he wasn't a hundred percent, but even on the day, if you take away some controversial calls, he likely could have won just for perspective, like even not on a great day, even not being full, fully healthy, but you gotta give credit where it's due. And we had two, two kids, uh, Callie who's a junior and Tim, who's, uh, maybe 25, like still young. Yeah. Who both had phenomenal days, uh, Callie with a huge uh, PR total. Tim, uh, I believe, like maybe slightly beating his total in weight class down. Like great days, and they they stayed with Taylor. Uh, Taylor was in the lead throughout, but they stayed with him and they made it. They forced Taylor, who pulled before them, to load something that I did not like the decision to load. I was saying, you know, I was telling everyone, I was like, I think he's got to go with 317 or 320, right? So pushed him another 10 kilos or seven and a half. He was 323. And it literally was like probably two kilos too much, like three, 317 for sure. And 320 probably were in the tank. 323 was slightly out of it. And they both go after him. They both pull, they both beat him by half a kilo. And um, I mean, it was close. The podium was separated by half a kilo. You can't really get better than that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's the only way you can get better than that is having it be really close and them all being like above the world record. But I think it was a phenomenal, phenomenal battle. And I think it's a big uh, storyline just because it's Taylor got dethroned. And now what does that mean? Is Taylor just a little time and he's going to come back? Is it is it still his class and he just, somebody took it while he was injured or is it no longer his class? Or, or maybe the best case scenario, um, he comes back and it's not, he just takes it back easily, but it comes back and now we get to see real battles and yeah. real battles with like big totals. So I think that would be ideal. Um, we have to see, I mean, he is getting older. He does have, he has a little kid now. Um, he's got whatever other obligations. He will be back, and, but nobody knows, will he be back to what we know Taylor as? So I think that was a very, very big storyline. For sure. That's an amazing summary, man. Um, let me just ask you both the question and Julia, if you have any other things you want to add, go ahead. But um, I mean, these guys, Callie and Tim, like Tim broke the squat world record. So like this, these are not slouches, like they're putting up big numbers. Um, Callie broke the, the junior deadlift world record on his second attempt and then broke the open world record on his third attempt. And it looked like he had more in the tank on that third deadlift. So you can kind of see where the uh, decision where, where Taylor, I mean, he ended up losing, like they both totaled 778. Callie wins on body weight. Tim finishes in second. Taylor finishes 777.5. I mean, you can easily say like going up from 310 to 323 on the final deadlift, like hindsight's 2020. Maybe he only needed another seven kilos and could have done 317, like you said, and he could have, he would have won if these guys would have done the same total, but Callie had definitely had let more left in the tank. Like Callie could have done more than 778 if necessary. How much more? We don't know. Would he have messed up? You know, he does sumo again. If he, if he, if Taylor hits that third deadlift, then it puts pressure on Kelly. Now it's like putting all this pressure on him. Like I have to actually go out and make this in order to win. And it's going to be something that's going to, you know, be even, he has to go even above the open world record, what he did in order to win. Um, so I think it's pretty exciting, but do you guys think that if Taylor wasn't there and these guys came in and totaled 778, that anyone would be talking about the 74s? No. I mean, okay, I, I'm being too harsh. Yes, people would discuss it, but I think I think Taylor needs to be there. Needs to be there and needs to be at least at somewhat strength for people to to care. Um, this is gonna lead something that we're gonna discuss later with um 
Wasker in the 59s and the 6'6 as well, whereas it's not enough to win sometimes. There has to be something that people want to see specifically, whether that be going for a record, whether that be a specific personality. There needs more than just a battle or more than just a number to get to get the hype and get the discussion that's deserved. I mean, there are times that people do things that are deserved to be talked about, but it's not necessarily talked about. So I think while if the same battle happened and first and second were one on body weight with the same exact totals, while it would deserve to be discussed, it would it would be discussed, but not close to the same amount if Taylor wasn't there. Yeah, what do you think, Julia? Yeah, so actually, um, that kind of leads into something that I uh, that I wanted to bring up. Um, a certain seventy five kilo lifter um, followed Power Powerlifting America, uh, followed the Powerlifting America Instagram account, and I think that. If Taylor isn't there, um, Austin Perkins needs to be for it to be a, a um, something that's talked about. And I think that this just, um, you know, we're going to have to talk about this later too, is some of these people that are going to come over from USAPL, um, maybe they have said something, maybe they haven't, maybe it's, you know, speculation on my part, but um, I think that that's going to be a storyline too, because Austin totaled, I believe it was 825 and it looked, it looked easy. Yeah. Um, and I, I think he has kind of said something about wanting to come over. So, um, you know, if he does and he's capable of doing that at worlds, um, maybe we'll see Taylor, um, try to put up something close to his 838 because at that point, you know, um, those are two big totals that are well over 800 kilos and he'll have to put something up like that um, to beat him. Um, I also just wanted to say, uh, you know, Shell, who's beaten Taylor before, um, he was actually in the B flight for yeah. this, um, for this competition, which, you know, we could say like, maybe we wouldn't have been talking about this, um, this weight class if Taylor wasn't there, but the fact that a previous world champion and someone who's actually beaten Taylor was in the B flight is um, pretty remarkable. And it actually shows that um, there are people coming up in the 74s and it's not just the Taylor Atwood show anymore. Yeah, he finished fourth with a 760 um, from the B flight. So yeah, very interesting. Um, former world champion, Alexander Erickson, who won it the year when Taylor wasn't there, he finished in eighth with like a 740. So it's a big fall off after the top three. Um, and, and especially then after shell and all as well, but, um, but it's interesting because both of these storylines that we've heralded as like the biggest things that have happened at the world championships, I think both of them are really all about like the downfall of a hero, right? Like someone who is the superstar of the sport, uh, a king or a queen of the sport. And you're shaking your head. No, you don't think so. I disagree. I think we're looking at it wrong. I think these storylines, while obviously um, the the king, the hero, whatever, didn't win, I think the storylines are – We the sport 10 years ago was a very small sport. You could have people dominate because they were so much better than everyone else. I think here it's a matter of the talent has grown so much. What Taylor did on this day would have won the, would have won the last four worlds. Yeah, yeah. What uh, what seemed like what Bonica would have done if she lowered her deadlift opener and hit that would have won the last every world. I think what we're seeing is we're seeing the talent rise. Where even next year, right? Let's say Taylor and Bonica both come back and they both put good performances. I no longer think it's the Taylor show, it's the Bonica show that if they come in and have a good performance, they win. I think it's we're now seeing some parity. We have multiple people that can win. I think we're gonna. My favorite thing, I, I mean, I've been thinking about this since before Worlds and especially after, is we're getting to the point where the where the norm is to have a battle of great lifters with not knowing who's going to win. And the exception are going to be the classes where you have somebody who's undisputed like Jesus or Amanda. We're getting to the point where the talent is so good in almost every weight class that in almost every weight class, even if the best lifter has a good day, it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what the storylines are. 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good point. That's a very positive uh, way of looking at it. But again, I would like, I think, and definitely if you think of 84 plus is, um, even Monique on a good day, I mean, 693 is 693. Like you're having, you're, you're going to have a big problem, but do you think if Taylor totaled 778.5 and wins by a chip over these guys that we're still talking about this session as being like one of the best battles? Yeah. You don't think it requires Taylor to lose for it to make it the biggest thing that happened at worlds. I think if Taylor, I think if Taylor total 778 and a half and then uh, we have a pull for the win and the person just misses, like let's say misses in like a Taylor style. I think it might not be a hundred percent of the storyline this is, but I think it, it goes up there. I, I yeah. think, yeah. It's a good point. I think, I think, I think you're hitting on a separate sort of storyline, which is just the talent pool rising and every weight class being super competitive. I think that's definitely a true thing, but I think, right. I think it, without having, you know, uh, this sort of like the hero lose in this case, like this isn't as big of a storyline because obviously he wins all the time. So, I mean, that's kind of like the boredom that we were getting into in the previous years, like last year where he totaled 790 at like RPE seven is what it looked like. And it was like, like so easy for him, like that, that no one was really talking about it other than the fact that he kicked walked to another world championship and was going to start, you know, prepping to smash that at Sheffield there wasn't really much else to talk about, but now there is thanks to these other guys coming up and thanks to the fact that for the first time in a long time, he's lost. Right. So, you know, let me like switch my statement a little bit. I agree with you in terms of the specific storyline this year, meaning the storyline is definitely, yes, the King queen lost their crowns. I think the overwhelming storyline though, is not okay. So they did lose their crowns. They got beaten slash bombed out, but I don't think it's, and then are they now, done is it the decline i think more than that is it's now are they at the point where even if they come back is it no longer using one of your phrases is it no longer just the taylor era and maybe just now it's the era of the battle of the 74s yeah um yeah. so clear. actually ahead, i wanted to disagree with that um i think that if taylor had um won by half a kilo I think that it wouldn't have been nearly as big a story. And I think it's because, you know, again, he's totaled 838 and he has said he's injured. We know he's been injured. We He went on King of the Lifts and he told his whole story about how he's not the same Taylor and all that. And so I think that that would have detracted severely from the storyline. I think a, a seven, what would it be? A I'm seven... 87.5 right um or sorry yeah 779, 778.5 any of those yeah 778.5 taylor atwood is not the same taylor atwood as an 838.5 taylor atwood and i think everyone in the world knows that so um yeah i mean that to me that would detract severely from that storyline i could see how you know, it would still be like, well, people are catching him and, um, you know, he's not, maybe he's never going to be that Taylor Atwood again. Um, but um, the fact of the matter is it's not, it still wouldn't be close to his best performance, not by a long shot. So. Yeah. And I, I think too, like if you, even if you look at the 84 pluses, it's like, it's like Brittany Schneider did something absolutely remarkable, but like the whole time we're basically talking about Bonica's bomb out, like it, it means more when you put up a world record total, like a 693 that she did, and you did it with the queen there, with, with her there, put, applying pressure, and even could say that pressure that Brittany Schlater put on her, forcing her to bomb out, like that makes it that much sweeter. Like, like of course, if, if, if Bonica wasn't there, like Bonica wasn't there before one time when Brittany Schlater won a world championship, and Bonica had stuff to say about that afterwards, like, oh, I wasn't there, that's the only reason why you won, um, and it it wasn't as big of a storyline, of course. And then now the fact that she is there, you know, and she does it like right in your face, like basically it's the equivalent of getting posterized is what happened with Brittany Slater, like in basketball, like she dunked on Bonica, like in her face and Bonica, like basically, and Bonica got called with for a charge or something, you know, like on top of it. So it's like, uh, so, or whatever, got called for blocking or whatever, but yeah. Um, but so it's important. I mean, I think, I think it's just like these stars, these superstars like Bonica and Taylor, they 
they have a lot more to lose whenever they show up to these kind of competitions because of their star power, because of their track record, because everyone expects them to win. And it makes it a much bigger story whenever they don't, whenever they don't perform up to expectation. Okay. Next question on this is just, and then we'll take a break is what's, um, what do you got? What's your predictions for, on Taylor Atwood going forward? Okay. Um, um, or you go first. Julia, let's go. Julia, yeah. go first. Um, Taylor, I hope you're not listening. Um, I think Taylor comes back and I think he has a better performance than he did these past two Sheffield and worlds. I don't think we ever see a 38 Taylor ever again. I think that was phenomenal. Uh, his training going to that was insane. He was fully healthy. He had less other things going on in life. I think we do see Taylor in the 800s again. And I think, but I don't think we ever see 38. Uh, I wanted to mention this earlier when Julia was saying that maybe Austin comes and hits a big total and forces Taylor to, I don't think it's a matter of forcing Taylor to hit anything anymore. It's a matter of, can he hit it? Like, is it there? It's not a matter of, we have to push it. Like if you don't push him, he's going to sandbag like the previously. Now it's a matter of, is Taylor's top end on the day good enough? And yeah. I think I think we will see him come back and win maybe another world championship, maybe more. But I don't think we ever see another – I don't think we ever go back to the point where it's Taylor's and then it would take catastrophe for him to lose. I think that error is done. All right, Julia? Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I, I'd say, um, you know, at this point and, you know – Previously, I would say Taylor has has kept his cards pretty close to his chest. Um, I would say it's probably what we're looking at now, and you know we can only go by you know what what we've seen is I think it's highly unlikely that he gets back to um, that eight thirty eight anytime soon. I think um, the only way that that happens and. Again, I'm not saying that it's that it's likely it's going to happen. You know, like Austin could come over and just, you know, blow everyone out of the water. But I think that the only way that happens is if he is pushed. And because we've seen him, you know, not be pushed and he'll he'll total 790, you know. Well, um, he's pushed now. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that somebody has to come in. And somebody has to total well over 800 for him to be even getting approaching that level of that 838. So the rumors are swirling. They're like, if you're going to make a guess, if you're a betting person, you're going to probably bet on the fact that Austin Perkins is coming over um, and that he's going to be at nationals, which will probably be in March. Um, and if Taylor doesn't get the invite for Sheffield, then Taylor will also be at nationals. And it's shaping up, and that's a lot of a lot of time from now for Taylor to get healthy, for him to throw down some like you know stack a bunch of blocks on top of each other and build back up, because you know Austin's going to be able to, to in Austin, Texas, where he lives, which is where Nationals. I, I'm not I'm not confirming that's where it's going to be, but there's a probability that it could be there or somewhere else in Texas, somewhat nearby, for Austin, uh, Austin Perkins, that is, um, and. Yeah, that's going to be an epic showdown at Nationals. I'm going to say I'm going to be the Taylor fanboy homer and just say that he's coming back fully. He's going to do 838. He's fired up. I would just say that being in the warm-up room with him was different. He's a different animal. He's different than any other lifter. Um, I mean, a lot of our lifters are top-level athletes, but he was different. He had a different energy. Um, when I look at him in the eye, I think he's the only one of all of the athletes I've met in powerlifting that just has like this look in his eye, like, like, like an animal. Like it reminds me of looking like I've seen bears in the wild and it like scare the shit out of you when you can see, and you can look him in the eye. It just looks like pure death. Taylor has that look in his eye. Like, and he had that look after the competition was over. Um, even though he, he was very gracious and went around and took selfies with all these people. I think he did a selfie with Callie and everything. And everyone in the warm-up room wanted to come over and do, do a selfie with him. And he was very gracious about it. Um, even though he was furious um, about the officiating and just his performance in general. And he, him and his coach, Jason Trombley, were already talking about the game plan going forward. My my vote is Taylor's not done. I think he'll win another world championship for sure. I don't, 838, I don't know if it's necessary. I think I think he'll put up a total that's big enough to win Sheffield at some point. Um, so whatever that would be, like 825, 820, somewhere in that range. But no, I think Taylor's going to be back with a vengeance. 
And I think that this competition has only fired him up even more than he already was because he already has that animal instinct, like I said. So, all right. Um, anything else? Any final thoughts on that before we take a break? No, just, before we take a break, I just want to make sure that I was clear. I don't think he's done. I think yeah. he comes back, he wins more world championships. Yeah. I'm not saying he's done. I just don't think we see 838. I think it's, I think we're looking more 800, 810. I don't, I think 838 was a the, potentially the greatest performance I've ever seen. And I don't know if he or anybody in the near future will replicate it. Um, we know Taylor, uh, what we know, uh, Austin did that, whatever. It's a local meet, wasn't IPF judging. Uh, his depth in general is a little bit more questionable. I don't know that, I don't think we see a 74 total 838 plus at a international meet in the next few years. I mean, at the closest thing would be at Sheffield, possibly at some point, um, will probably be the highest totals that you'll see from the 74s. Probably be at Sheffield. It seems like they've got um, a little bit of a, more of a say in the refs that are there and whatnot. It seemed like the refing was like, every, no one complained about the refing at Sheffield, basically. Like fr from, from just listening to everyone talk about it, like and paying attention on social media, basically nobody complained about Sheffield a little bit. They were questioning like why Jesus is, um, you know, got two reds on his third deadlift and then it got overturned and every, you know, everything was made right. Right. But, um, Gavin, Gavin complained about it. A yeah. About the overturn and whatever, but still, I feel like that was like, that's the right amount of refing controversy that you want coming yeah. out of a major competition like that, where you didn't feel like the refs decided the game at the end. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, because Gavin still went on and still was in contention and still had a, a fight in there, right? And then obviously Jesus too, I think he already had it wrapped anyway on his second. So, so I mean, either way, the refs didn't really change outcome. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do the opposite and say he's going to totally 850. Fuck it. <laughs> he said before on a podcast the sky's the limit i'm gonna total 850 at one point so I, I i believe the man he said 850 one time on a podcast a long time ago i think 850 and the sky's the limit for taylor atwood um he has uh, had his young son owen who's amazing and his whole family is amazing his dad and, and his mom and everything um they're gonna get all that stuff in order, all the day job stuff like is going to get settled out. It was tumultuous. It was COVID. It was ha having a new son. Um, as he gets older, gets into like daycare, preschool, stuff like this. I think Taylor's going to be back with a, with a vengeance and he's going to, him and Austin are going to battle it out. And we're going to see, like, we're going to have a new era of the battles in the 74s and it's going to be amazing. Um, really last thing on this and let's so anything else you want to wrap about Taylor, but Callie's not going anywhere. This 778, like, what do you think he's actually good for on the day? He was good for at least probably 780, 785, maybe. What do you think, Mike? Somewhere in that range, like, fully. I think, he could, I think he could have loaded another 10 to 12 on that lifts. I think he 787 to 790. So you're saying basically he's he's strong enough to put together a 790 day together, like, today. Um, what? How strong will he be a year from now? at the next competition because he's putting he's adding to his total in a hurry so let me just check if what i'm about to say is accurate okay it's not he's no longer on the nominations for junior worlds oh, uh, he, he was yeah um i think next year i think if you don't total 800 next year you have no shot of winning so you think Cali is going to probably total, you think he's good for 790. He's putting like 20 kilos a year on his total. Um, I so think he'll be, I think at minimum he'll be into the eights. Okay. Minimum, maybe, maybe eight, 10. Julia, yeah, yeah. any final thoughts on this whole 74s? Yeah. I mean, just um, to the Cali question, I think, yeah, I, I would say he, he had a bit more on the deadlift and um, you know, I agree 790 now and then, you know, low, possibly mid eights but I, I like i i would say like um uh, probably around eight eight ten um is is good you know eight eight oh five to eight fifteen um range um if we want to bring up the the jury stuff now um i do have some no, let's hold um, it on the jury stuff and then we can also yeah. get into it because we'll, we'll come back to this weight class as we go through briefly we won't go through everything all over again because like mike do a really good job of like kind of giving us a whole backstory on this um but just real quick on that cali did go nine for nine again so there's always some controversy and there's some refs and some bad calls but then there's always someone else going nine for nine 
right? So it's like, you can make your lifts undeniable and you can go nine for nine. It is possible. Like we have in the same flight where we had this controversial jury overturn on Taylor squat um, and his, you know, controvert semi-controversial third deadlift. We got another guy going nine for nine, breaking the world record deadlift. So, and breaking the world junior record. So, and have a, a massive PR. So it's, you know, it cuts both ways, you know, with this jury and this referee stuff. Some people are undeniable. And if you, you know, if you're getting call, bad calls like this, you got to look to yourself and look at what you can do better to, you know, get three whites so that you don't get stuff overturned. But, okay, with that, let's take a break. So you guys picked two sort of negative stories, people losing uh, as the biggest things that happen at the world championships. I'm going to pick something that didn't even technically happen at the world championships. It actually happened on the day off um, in between the sessions on the Wednesday during the, the IPF general meeting, general assembly. And that is that they announced officially, which we had heard rumors before, but they announced officially that the world games is going raw that the world games will now have 64 equipped lifters and 64 classic raw lifters as well. It's the first time ever that the world games will be including raw lifting, something that we've all been waiting for. We've all been clamoring for um, anyone who watched the world games last year was in Birmingham, Alabama. We talked a little bit about Bonica being there, but it looked like a Sheffield type atmosphere um, as far as the, the production value and the venue, it was like, an it was like, like a theater room. It looked amazing. It's the best of the best. It's the closest thing that we have to the Olympics. The world games is a multi-sport games that happens all uh, happens with countries from all around the world. And it's basically just one tier below the Olympics. So this is for all intents and purposes, powerlifting's Olympics. Mike, do you have any more details about it? Yeah. So just a, a basic overview of how it's going to work in terms of qualifying. So um, I was told that the way it's going to work is the qualifier will be Worlds 2024. And it's going to be grouped in double weight classes. What that means is that similar to um, similar to certain other meets, um, we will have to be using some form of coefficient. But unlike meets where you have a 59 kilo lifters battling super heavyweights here it's going to be grouped as double weight classes so you'll have the 59 and 66s as one weight class so it'll be under 66 then under 83 then under 105 and then unlimited and then for the women you'll have under 52 uh under 63 under 76 and then unlimited so while it is going to be on coefficient it will um, only be between two weight classes. Now, in order to qualify, the top three, so the podium uh, at this coming worlds will get an automatic qualification. So top three in your weight class, you're guaranteed a qualification. Now, there will be two additional per grouping. So for example, just using uh, the 59s and 66s. So top three 59s, guaranteed. Top three 66s, guaranteed. Now. The other two spots will go to the two highest points of the 59s or 66s. You can have four and four or three and five or five and three, whatever. So three are guaranteed. And then the other two will go based off points. So I think this is great. It will make for more interesting battles at this coming world, just because um, personally for me, the world games uh, just seems like a, while obviously it might not have the specific monetary benefit of like Sheffield, I view it as a much bigger meet than Sheffield. Sheffield to me is a spectacle and it's cool to watch, but it's not a, it's not a powerlifting competition. Here it is a powerlifting competition and this will make it, we're coming top three and maybe fourth will be massive at this coming worlds. And I mean, I think the world games will be insane. Um, I didn't really see much of the actual lifting from the world games last year because I'm not a huge or... I don't know much about Equip. I'm getting a little bit more into it, but um, I didn't watch so much. But I did just see videos of like just the opening ceremonies and it looked insane. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm just like, the way I view it is uh, I don't know whether the Olympics is a pipe dream or whether it's a realistic thing somewhere in the future. But regardless, for now, this is going to be the highest level of power. The thing we're going to have the world champions and then all like the podium, meaning we're getting 
we're getting prime time of prime time. We're getting the best of the best in every weight class. We're yeah. literally getting a prime time, but it's split between two weight classes. So we're getting literally just the contenders, like the top level lifters. They're all going to be battling in a competition um, along with like other sports where honestly, I don't really know which other sports are in world games, to be honest. Sumo um, wrestling there lot, is in there. Right? Um, sumo wrestling is in there. I believe like softball, like women's softball is in there. Like there's, there's some other major sports in there for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, right. But it's just with a ton of other sports. Um, and in my opinion, if we were to make an Olympic bid in the future, I think this is our best bet because while we've already been in the world games for powerlifting, um, let's be honest, the future of powerlifting is raw. And if we want to ever make it into the Olympics, realistically, it would be raw. And this is our chance to showcase ourselves with all the other sports and honestly, hopefully steal the show, hopefully be the one that stands out. So I think this is just a major opportunity and it's pretty big news. Yeah. I mean, uh, speaking of stealing the show, I don't know if any of you all got to see the special Olympics world games was just going on in Berlin, Germany earlier this week, and it was all over ESPN. And in fact, I turned on my TV on uh, this last Sunday morning and they were doing like a recap of it and they had powerlifting in there. And they were saying on the, on the commentary on there that, that the powerlifting crowds were the, among the biggest crowds of the whole games. And so I think that, you know, it, we've shown that we can fill seats. We did it. They did it at Sheffield. They did it in Malta. And now I think by having the biggest stars in powerlifting, which to be honest, I mean, I love equipped and I also love classic. I, I respect them both, but there's no question that the biggest stars are in, are on the classic side like and bringing that star power to the world games filling up those seats getting people going screaming you know going crazy for jesus and amanda and natalie richards and all these superstars that we have now um you know it, it's gonna elevate the sport and it's gonna hopefully propel us into the olympics but even if it doesn't the world games by itself is amazing there's athlete village it's like an athlete complex just like you would see at the olympics so the athletes are going to be treated in the same way that they would be treated if they were going to the olympics very serious you know like they're staying in like a uh, complex together they're they're having meals together they're going to be able to have meals i talked to the athletes that were there at the world games last year they're basically having meals with people from other countries from different sports all kinds of things all mixing in together it's really cool the opening ceremonies i believe they had nelly singing at the opening ceremonies uh this this last one like i mean like they have like it was crazy like they filled like a football stadium full of people it's like look like an opening ceremony is like you would see at the olympics of course a little more scaled down but um still uh, spectacular and this this one will be in 2025 in the summer i believe like the first week of august or something like that um and it will be in Chengdu, china so talk about doing it big they're going to do it huge for this. You know, there's like, there's going to be a ton of people there. So it's going to be a ton of eyeballs. And also, you know, um, it could hopefully spark more interest for powerlifting across Asia as well. Julia, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so I listened to the podcast with Tony Cliff um, with King of the Lifts and I they he kind of, and I don't want to misquote him or, or misunderstand him, but you know, the consensus was that with um, raw powerlifting going into the World Games now and having it split, like, you know, this could mean the end for equip lifting. And I actually think it's the opposite. I think because raw powerlifting will be in the World Games, more eyes from the raw side will be on powerlifting in general. And as a consequence, they will also see the equip side. And, you know, some of the lists being put up on the equip side um, and some some of the lifters there, um, they have real personalities. They put up some amazing, amazing lifts. I mean, we'll, we'll touch on this later, I, I think, but I think one of the most underrated lifters um, in the world um, is Carol Agar, and she started out um, and still does equip, you know. We have Taylor LaChapelle, um, I think we who in her post competition press conference in Scottsdale was asked, who's your biggest rival? And she said, Carola Gara, um, <laughs> because Carola won uh, the world games in, in Birmingham last year. So, yeah, I mean, she just, and then she just broke the world record in the 63s, which was Leah's record it was a big deal. Um, definitely superstars. But the fact that now all the raw side is going to be watching them as well. And you see them a little here and there, Bonica, Carola, 
that are crossover athletes, right? Like they draw a little bit of attention, but yeah, go finish what you were saying, Julia. Oh, um, I mean, that was, that was, you know, essentially my main point is that there's storylines there um, and they're kind of intertwined with the raw side. And I think that because of that, um, they're not going to be as separated and we're not, maybe we'll see people view, you know, single ply and, you know, there's, there, there are other kinds of quick lifting, but, um, you know, we might start viewing single ply and raw instead of, you know, as completely different sports as something that's intertwined in the same sport. And I think that that could be really good and it could really change, um, the scene of powerlifting. I don't think single ply will ever overtake raw. Um, you know, like raw is much more accessible. Um, it's much easier for people who don't power lift to understand. Um, and so there's a much wider appeal, but, um, I think that it will, um, definitely draw attention to equip lifting and definitely, um, unite the sport a little bit more. Yeah. I think that's a really good point is, is like, I don't think it's the end of equipped. I think equipped is always going to be around, um, Emmanuel. Um, I talked to with him about this in Austin before the announcement was made, he was telling me that they were going to do this and that they didn't want to just do away with equipped that they wanted to, you know, like you said, put them side by side and let people from the raw side, see the equipped lifters and, and vice versa as well. So I think it'll be great for equipped. I mean, at power in America, we're trying to make equipped cool. Like we, we definitely are. We have some stars. We mentioned Taylor LaChapelle, you know, like we mentioned Kelsey McCarthy, we mentioned Kimmy Johnson, Noah Johnson. We got some superstars on the equipped side that they just need a little spotlight. They just need a little marketing and PR, a little media team behind them. And um, hopefully they can uh, generate some buzz around it. And certainly with, I remember messaging top, top, top level coaches earlier this year, asking if they had any athletes that were going to be competing at the world games. And they were like, what is it um, like in our sport? So just the fact that now everybody knows what world games even is on the raw side, like it's going to, it's going to help blow up the sport for sure. Um, and just speaking with a couple of the athletes that I don't, I won't mention their names, but they mentioned to me that this is, the highest pinnacle. This is what they will be shooting for, that they will do whatever it takes to get to the world games. And this is meaning even above and beyond Sheffield. So like, even though you're not going to win as much money by going to world games, but the prestige of being in the, in one of these multi-sport games that only comes around every three or four years, whatever it is, um, is so much more prestigious that, that they will, if ha they have to choose between going to this or going to Sheffield, they're going to choose going to world games. So that's just out there. So there's no question that if it's creating that kind of buzz amongst the athletes that we're going to see more athletes coming over to power team America, more athletes, more interest in the IPF in general, because your only way to get to the world games is going to be through power. If you're in the U S is through power team American nationals um, or through USVI. Um, and so it should create more buzz for Power Team America. It should help grow our federation, which will in turn hopefully help grow the IPF and the sport as a whole. So I'm excited about it. It's going to be amazing. And again, you mentioned the number of athletes per flight. What is it? Eight and eight again, right? So it sounds like it's going to be eight and eight. So um, for the athletes out there, like get ready. Like this is where it's going to be like at World Games too. And I know also with the qualifying, uh, Mike, you were talking about it. There are some other considerations for like regional qualifying. Um, so yeah, there, there's certain regions that have to be represented. I think, I think I saw something about that, um, where like, it's not just going straight on GL points. I think it's going, if there's a region that's unrepresented, they can get it. And then I know for a fact, because last year we got to get four athletes, two on each side, women and men. Um, into the world games just by being the host country. So I think you also, there's a consideration for the host country as well. So maybe it'll end up being more, I'm not sure exactly. Um, but as far as how to auto qualify, you're dead on podium at worlds next year in Lithuania. So let's go. And all right. Anything else you guys want to say about world games? Other news from the general assembly. Um, Power in America is now a full voting member of the IPF. So we were voted in as a full member. And then other news from it was the other big news was that Eurosport is now doing going to broadcast Euros as well on Eurosport. And they're extending, they're going to do like more extensive coverage of the world championships next year. 
So, and their contract has been renewed for like, I, I don't know, like many more years into the future. So that's pretty cool. And then any other updates on the general assembly that you guys made note of? Mike, no? No, all right, cool. So anyway, that was something that happened at the World Championship. I think that was really big. I think it's going to change the sport for a long time to come. So, and it's a positive thing. So it's a very Paul thing to bring up. All right. Uh, next, what are the storylines that you think people are going to be talking about for the next few months? And we'll start off with you, Julia. All right. So this one's a little bit controversial, but, um, you know, I saw a lot of comments right after, um, you know, the, the competition took place about this. So I think it's worth mentioning. Um, SBD has very good media team and they put out announcements very quickly um, after uh, people won their classes um, that they would get invites to the Sheffield, you know, confirming that they, they are invited to Sheffield 2024. That didn't happen for Callie or Tony. And um, I did notice that they were not wearing complete SBD um, from head to toe. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, um, but it was uh, conspicuous and um, it, it matched with the fact that they did not receive the invites right away. Um, I'm not privy to the politics or, or the business negotiations that are going on, but um, many, many people were talking about that. And so I think that it would be remiss of me not to bring it up. So you think, and this is definitely something that people are going to be talking about. They were already talking about it. They're going to keep talking about it. Um, it's notable that Tony was is an A7 sponsored athlete. Um, he's not sponsored by SPD. He wasn't wearing anything SPD, right? Um, and it is notable as well that both Callie and Tony did everything necessary to qualify for Sheffield according to all the other rules that we knew about in advance, such as hitting 95% and winning the weight class, right? They did both of those things. So... Um, so yeah, Mike, what's, what's your, what do you know about it? So from what I understand, from what I've heard, um, if you watched, um, worlds, you notice there's other lifters or at least guaranteed one Anatoly who also was not wearing, uh, SPD stuff. But the difference is that, um, and, and Cal just Anatoly was invited to Sheffield. Yeah, Anatoly got, got, the, got the invite, got the, the post, whatever. But um, we're in Titan. Yeah, Titan, Titan, yeah. Um, but both Callie and Tony, um, they weren't wearing SPD stuff, but they both lift for countries that have a SPD contract. So uh, Great Britain and Sweden both have an SPD contract. Um, the singlets, if you notice, they're all wearing their SPD singlets. Uh, was Tony wearing the SPD singlet? Because Callie, Callie was. Yeah, Tony was wearing A7. I think he's a he's a fully A7. He, he, he didn't for the singlet. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a especially uh, made A7. I, I remember it now. It had a British flag right on the back on on the back of it. Yeah, he definitely wasn't was wearing an A7 singlet. Okay. So Cali definitely was wearing the uh, the regular SPD uh, Sweden singlet. Um, Tony was not, I guess. But um, yeah, so that is part of the issue. Um, if the countries have the contract, then the lifters um, are supposed to be wearing it. It leads to uh, some controversy. We've ha already dealt with this a little bit by Sheffield last year where Chance got the invite, right? He won Worlds, got the auto invite. And then there was apparently a lot of issues between the two parties in terms of what he was allowed to wear, what he was allowed to say, all these different things, which ultimately led to Chance not going to Sheffield and disappearing off the face of the earth. But the point being that there is some sort of contract i guess where um you don't necessarily have to be an spd sponsored athlete to go to sheffield but you definitely cannot wear other stuff and i'm not sure what the um results are going to be in this case 
if I had to guess, I would say that Cali ends up just signing an SPD sponsorship because he, I, as far as I know, he's not sponsored by anyone else. So it was just a matter of him wearing like his insert sleeves because he just probably thought those gave him the best performance. But presumably now he'll sign the sponsorship um, and then get the Sheffield invite. I don't know what, I mean, Tony's obviously an A7 sponsored athlete, so he's not going to do that, which would mean he obviously can't wear his A7 stuff. I don't know whether he's going to get the invite at all. I would, I don't know because when they put out the criteria, the criteria said quite clearly, you win, you get 95%, whatever, you get an invite. It didn't say anything. It didn't, um, maybe there's some fine print, but the actual post they put out did not make any mention of anything to do with what you're wearing. So, but I think it makes mention that you have to be in good standing with the IPF and well, does it say that you have IPF. to be standing with your with your uh, national federation? There's something connection with your national federation. Like if your national federation, if you're not in good standing with them, which maybe by not wearing these things, they got in bad standing with their uh, national federations. And then the national federations are the ones that ultimately have to like do the paperwork, I believe, to get you into Sheffield. So maybe so that's the issue. The only thing about that, though, is like that makes sense, but – Ultimately, like it's up to the national federation. Like, for example, like I know in junior worlds, we had some lifters that were wearing their insert sleeves with their US SPD singlets. And theoretically, the coach or or a Robert or Mike Z or somebody could have said something, but nobody made any sort of complaints or mentions or issues with it. So I understand that as definitely in the case where you're wearing your SPD. Uh, singlet like with like your uh, team speedy singlet with your insulin, I understand that's definitely a problem, but I don't know in terms of whether that would invalidate your your uh, invitation or it's just something that you have to work out. I'm hoping that it's just a matter of working it out between both Callie and Tony and them getting the Sheffield spot that they earned. Um, but if they don't. I mean, right now, I've heard people talk about it a little bit. If they end up not getting the SPD spot, uh, the Sheffield spot, then it will probably leap into number one in terms of the topics people are discussing. So hopefully this will this is one of the topics that it will be discussed, but will eventually go away just because it's been resolved and not because it wasn't resolved. So I guess we'll have to wait for more official updates. Yeah. But yeah. This is all, by the way, just disclaimer, pure speculation on our behalves. Like, we don't know. We don't have any in inside information from SPD or anyone oh, no, else. No. That, um, what I said, what I said was, was a quote from someone. It's not official information, but it's not, it wasn't a guess. It was okay. what I was told from a, from it. It was a so, secondhand tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't mention the names. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you don't want to get in trouble with anyone um, on this it. podcast. Um, but yeah, Julie, did you have anything else you want to follow up with on this? Oh no. I mean, I did I did forget to mention um the the chance uh the chance Mitchell issue, which um also affected me um picking this as something that would be talked about. Yeah, I mean, you know, with um things like this, you know, Sheffield is a an IPF sanctioned event. Um, but it, it, it's really put on by SBD. And so, and because it's also so new, there's a lot of like things yeah. that aren't, you know, set in stone here. So I think going forward, we'll see um, more formalization of things, but you know, for now um, there's, there's still quite a bit up in the air. And I mean, just as far as like, I know that there is no thing that like, you can't wear other things like joy war a seven at Sheffield, right? Like she competed at Sheffield. She wore a seven, um, last year. I'm, I'm pretty sure she wore a seven at the world championships in South Africa. I don't know. I guess off the top of my head, I, I can't remember, but, um, so, and she wore it at Sheffield. So, I mean, there's always one of these counter examples of someone who like, maybe they didn't fill out the right paperwork or whatever. And joy did do all the right stuff to like get in and get in with her a seven stuff. So, I mean, it's just a matter of, you know, if you follow the right procedures and processes and maybe, maybe 
Kelly or Tony didn't. I don't know. It's pure speculation, but definitely something um, that's interesting. Obviously, Sheffield has captured the imagination of the powerlifting world. Um, and so everyone's talking about it. Any little thing about Sheffield um, is going to be news and they're going to be in the spotlight for all the little decisions of stuff that they make on on topics like this good or bad, you know, like that's going to come with the territory. If you put on the best power of team meet ever, like you're going to get a lot of people talking about it. So, and they're going to be scrutinizing every little thing of like, you know, who, who ultimately shows up and who doesn't. So anyway, anything, any final thoughts on that? Otherwise let's move on to the thing that Mike, you think people will be talking about for the next few months. So I think one of the topics that will continue to be in discussion and has been discussion since the beginning of worlds and has not dropped out of the news cycle is the jury. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, the way it works at these international meets and even potentially national meets is besides for the three judges you have, there are either three or five jury members who are sitting uh, in like a corner area. And if a light, if a lift gets two white or two red lights, they theoretically have the ability to review the lift. Now, let me just explain a little bit. In general, in the past, the way the jury was used is, let's say a lifter got two red lights, right? Especially if it's a missed second attempt or somebody missing bombing out. So now the team coach or the personal coach would go to the jury and they'd protest the call because they think it's really a good lift. The jury would take a look at it. And if the jury thought, agreed with the coach and thought that it was a bad call, they would overturn the lift. Now, additionally, if an opposing team uh, lifter hit a lift and it only got two white lights, now you're, you as the opposing coach would have the ability to go and protest to the jury. You, what you do is you'd uh, give them 100 euro, whatever. And the point of that being so people wouldn't just go protest every two white light lift. Ironic, isn't it? Um, but then they would take a look at it, and if they thought that it was a bad lift, they would overturn it, and yeah. Now, yeah. So, so basically, was- what you're saying is, like, it was part of the strategy, and it was part of the game, was that you had to be watching other people's lifts, other people are going to be watching your lifts, and if there's two-to-one decisions, then you can either, you know, then there's ways to go and protest the jury and approach the jury, make a case to them of what you thought was wrong with the calls, and then try to get those lifts overturned either in the favor of your lifter or against one of your opponents. Yes, but the important thing to note there is it was used um, as a way to prevent when there was a bad call that could affect an outcome, you would have the ability to protest it and it could get changed. But it wasn't there as a replacement for the refs. You have the refs on the platform, they do their job, they generally do a pretty good job, and we trust them. And if we didn't, they shouldn't be roughing. These are IPF, CAT 1, CAT 2 referees, highest level referees. They're trusted to judge at the biggest meets in powerlifting, and they should be trusted. Now, the reason why people are talking about this and why it has become controversial is, I wouldn't say for the first time, but definitely, I believe, the most pronounced time, the jury decided at this World Championships that they were no longer going to wait for coaches to go protest bad lifts or good lifts. They were going to look at every lift that got two whites or two reds. Now, what does looking at a lift mean? Right? There's no issue with the, the jury looking at the lifts. They should be looking at the lifts, right? If the jury is going to potentially overturn a call, they should be looking at the lifts. But what they were doing here is they were viewing every single lift that wasn't three whites or three reds. And overturning, I don't know the exact percentage. Somebody would have to go through the actual footage of every lift, but overturning a decently high percentage of them. More and than we're talking about what? Noticeably more than in the past. Yeah, noticeably more than in the past. And um, and this is without, especially the ones that were overturned from good to bad. I believe none of those were even protested by other coaches. Or if, if somewhere, it was a very small percentage of those. They were just getting overturned in general. And um, everyone's discussing this because we had multiple weight classes where we had battles, uh, probably most notably um, – Taylor and Bonica, right, mentioned earlier, Bonica bombing out on a lift that was initially given two white lights. 
Taylor getting his squat uh, overturned. That initially got two white lights, which cost him seven and a half kilos. And we didn't even mention this earlier because we weren't really breaking down the full weight class, but Tim Arigati, who came in second, he hit his third deadlift, got two reds, and the jury overturned it to a good lift, which I I think that was a horrible mistake. I don't know how that possibly passed. Yeah, it was very questionable um, all um, just looking at it. Right. Honestly, that case, though, is the case that I least have an issue with because even though I disagree with the call, my issue with the jury is not that I don't agree with their decisions. That was a standard case of a, a lifter getting two reds and his coach going and protesting lift. That yeah. is how I believe that the jury should play out. And whether or not I agree with the jury calls is not my issue with the jury. I'm not here to say the refs were good or the refs were bad. I'm here to say that the refs slash not the refs, the jury in this case is overstepping what they should be used for. Mm-hmm. I know some of you probably like powerlifting, but aren't like sports fans in general, but as a big sports fan um, who basically, rem- I mean, football's had challenges for a little bit, but basically has remembered when, all the other sports have introduced like replay. There's a system to the replay. They don't just go, well, actually now the NFL cha- automatically reviews every turnover and every scoring play, whatever. They review too many plays. But the point is, in, even still, they don't review random plays. Um, or in baseball, like they don't just review random calls. The coach has to go use one of his, in, in football, you get two challenges. If you're the most successful, you get a third challenge. Yeah. In baseball, I, you get like two, I don't even know if baseball challenges rules because it's not usually applicable. In hockey, you get one challenge. You get a limited amount of challenges, and you can use them. And if they – not only if they agree. This is another thing I don't like. It's one thing if, if there's two whites, and the jury looks at it, and they're like, mm, I think it was maybe high. No. The way it is in sports is to get a call overturned, there has to be like – whether it's called irrefutable evidence or – overwhelming evidence that the wrong call was made. If you have a borderline call and you're not sure, you have judges on the platform for a reason. Their the job the is the correct call. Yeah, that's what it's called, right? It doesn't have to be confirmed, but it's the call in the field stands. You know what that means? A lot of times it means that maybe the ref made the wrong call, but it's not clear. So the call in the field stands. Yep. And that's my big issue. And I think a lot of people's issue with the jury. Number one is, they're getting too involved without being asked. Nobody's protesting it. I mean, we have a separate argument about whether there should be rules about how many protests you're allowed to have. Um, I, I personally think it's probably a good idea to do something like that where there's a set system. But even if not, even let's say there's still is unlimited protests, there still should not be changing anything until the coach uses one of their unlimited protests. Yeah. If nobody's protesting a lift, it's not their place to overturn the calls made by the judges. So that's the big issue, both them overstepping and getting too involved. And then the, also the willingness in when they're involved of overturning calls that are not super clear. So that's, I think people are discussing it. I think people will continue discussing it until either some rule change happens with how the jury is involved or until we see a little bit of a uh, calmer jury. Yeah, and just real quick um, before Julia, I'll, I'll kick it over to you in just a second. Um, I like the Tim Monogatti example that you made too, because you're right. That was one where I believe it was Rory, like plays the game, goes over, makes a compelling case as to why this call, this attempt should be given to his lifter, right? And then, and then it's overturned in the favor of the lifter, in the favor of making lifts, right? And I think that's another thing to think about too, is just like, how often we're taking lifts away from the athletes and how often we're like giving them lifts um, and, and giving the benefit of the doubt to the lifter, you know? So I think that's a good a nuance example that you gave there because even though it looked like his hand was like, it was definitely coming out of his hand and whatever, it looked weird. didn't look tidy or whatever, just like you could say with Taylor's in the same exact session. But nonetheless, I like the idea of the jury, you know, um, in response to whatever appeal Rory made, giving the lift back to the athlete as well. All right, Julie, what were you going to say? Yeah, um, so I was actually going to point out the uh, discrepancy, I would say, between how Taylor's deadlift was turned down and how Tim's was not. Um, Again, I don't have an issue with um, what happened with Tim's 
lift. I mean, I probably would have said it, it shouldn't have been overturned and it shouldn't have been given a good lift, but, um, you know, I don't have a problem with that, but it's when, you know, seemingly, and I'm not saying that this is the case, seemingly competitors are held to different standards. Um, and again, that's just what it looked like because Taylor's lift to me was about the same caliber as Tim's. Um, I don't, I don't think, you know, Taylor should have passed either, but it's just, you know, um, this is what happened. One of them passed, one of them didn't, and they both had, um, not so great lockouts. Um, now the other thing with the jury that I want to point out is I don't know how many people here, um, watch weightlifting, uh, the sport of, uh, weightlifting, um, in weightlifting, there's this rule called the press out and the jury loves to overturn lifts for microscopic violations of this press out rule. And basically what it is, is when you catch the bar, if your arm rebends at all, they consider that to be you pressing out instead of catching it overhead. Um, and, you know, lifts that are otherwise great will be turned down for, you know, maybe a half a centimeter movement around the elbow. Um, I don't want that for powerlifting. Um, there's a whole, there's even a whole movement in weightlifting called kick out the press out. Um, and because people are so annoyed by it. I don't want that for powerlifting. I think it ruins the flow of the meat. I think it ruins it for spectators. And I think it really messes up strategy for the lifters and the coaches in a way that is very hard to anticipate. And it, makes it less about how good of a coach and how well adapted of a lift you are and more about like, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and I, I don't really like that. I like it to be about strategy. I like it to be about people hitting lifts. Um, and I don't think that this is, this is a good situation. Um, I also, um, I like to do polls on my stories and I did a poll on this and, you know, obviously like, people who vote in these polls, they're not all IPF lifters um, and they don't know all the rules. So take that with a grain of salt, but they are all people who are big fans of the sport. And the poll was overwhelmingly, so the question was um, whether or not the jury should be able to overturn a lift um, whether it's two to one red or two to one white without um, anyone protesting it. And overwhelmingly, the results of the poll were that no, the jury should not be able to do that. And I agree with that because I think that, you know, we have the refs for a reason or the judges for a reason, and they, they're very qualified. Sometimes they're as qualified, usually at Worlds, they're as qualified as the people on the jury. So who are the people on the jury to overturn the calls of the judges when those judges might also be on the jury? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I really wasn't a fan of how this was handled. Um, I don't think there was any, you know, malintent with this. I think that this, I think this was the first time that, you know, instant replay was used. And I think everyone got a little excited about it. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't, I, I see where this could be headed and there's real life examples of this with, with weightlifting. And I just want, I don't want it to end up like that. I think that powerlifting has enough obstacles um, in terms of becoming mainstream sport. And I think that this could prove to be a hindrance if it's implemented incorrectly. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's definitely been controversial. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, so I just a uh, couple of things I just want to add either that I forgot to mention or I have to do with Julie's point. I'll start yeah. with the first one. Um, I just want to make sure that just to clarify for anyone listening, um, Tim and Taylor's deadlifts, you can compare them because uh, Taylor's didn't get overturned by the jury. Taylor got oh. three reds. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we got three. The jury okay. wasn't involved. Yeah, yeah. But that, that was a minor detail. The more important two things are number one is I want to fully agree with most of what Julia was saying. But not to disagree with her, but I just want to make a point out that I hear so many people getting wrong on social media. 
the jury did not have one video angle. They yeah, had one well, play. So everybody keeps saying they have the same. That's false. And you're right. If that was true, then you should be even angrier because then just thinking on a, a simple perspective, when you have three judges, that's from three different angles. If you only get one angle, so yeah, even if everyone agrees that it's a red light from that angle, that's still one red light. So even if all five jury members agree, it would be a red. So just yeah. that's another fact. They have multiple angles. But more importantly, getting back to the gist, um, the way I view it is that there are four groups of people that really matter in a powerlifting competition, right? We have the athletes, we've got the coaches, we've got the audience, meaning the viewers, the people there, and we got the referees, right? Without any, without any one of those four, it wouldn't, we, powerlifting wouldn't be what it is, right? We need all four of those. And those are the only four that really matter. Anyone else is nice. Like the media is great, but the bottom line is powerlifting theoretically can exist without the media. Those four are necessary. The way the jury is handling themselves is bad for all four. It's bad for these lifters, obviously, because they're just, they're missing lifts that were initially given to them. It, it change, it's going to change everything in terms of what their attempts are. It's bad for the coaches because now generally you get a lift. You have, you go over to the, you go over the scorer's table and you tell them what your next attempt is. But now you got to, every time you got to wait. Now, and it's bad for all the viewers, whether it be at home or in person, because number one is every time the jury's looking, it's getting paused, or even if it's not getting paused, uh, it's just harder to follow because you see, like, I remember at, the, at Sheffield, I'm watching and I see Gavin has a squat, and then only later do I see it, wait, he didn't get the squat. Like, I, mm. I'm just confused. That so happened here with the commentary, great. right? And then finally, the judges. In my opinion, it's just, it's, Forget about whether they're more or less qualified. In my opinion, it's disrespectful. We have these judges who are considered the best judges in the world. That's the reason why they're roughing them. They're roughing this high level meet. And if they're not, then whatever. Find the procedure where we have the best judges in the world. Now, I don't have an issue with a lift being overturned. Even the best judges in the world will make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. But by just constantly looking at every lift and changing lifts all the time, you're telling these judges who are considered the best judges in the world and have better view, like you have videos and this, that, but the bottom line is this is not a sport that gets determined on replay. This is a sport where you have judges in certain places. Well, then again, I don't necessarily like the new, I don't know when they started this a few years ago where the side judges are basically front judges as well. It makes no sense to me. They should be on the side. I know they're spotters, but still, but Still, they still have the best angles in the house. And you're saying that on this close call where two out of the three of you felt one way and one of you disagreed, that us sitting in the chair with a worse angle than you, yeah, we're looking at replays, but we're going to overturn your call. And we're going to do it like one out of every 10 lifters because it literally was a minimum one out of every 10, two white or two red lifts, at least 10%. To me, that's just disrespectful. So the way everybody from the lifter, the coach, the, the viewer, and, the, and the, the refs are all getting affected by these calls. I just think they're overstepping and something should be done. This, I think it's an issue. It's an issue and it should get resolved. Um, just to follow up on that real quick, what, what angles did they have? Cause like the, I, this is, I actually wanted to specifically ask you because I know there's been a lot of misinformation out there, people speculating about what angles the jury has on their replay and you were standing right next to the jury, basically the entire competition. So you tell us. Yeah. So if you notice on the live stream, obviously you didn't see much of the live stream because you were actually watching, but if anybody watching the live stream, if you notice like let's hand squats or any of these lifts. You don't see, there isn't like a video angle and just the lift is shown through one angle. There's, you see during the lift, the angles get cut. It switches from angle to angle throughout the lift. So let's say on a squat, you might see, they might show you an angle at the beginning, right? It gets the command. And then by the time the lift's re-racked, it might've switched to two or three different angles, but yeah. you never see the full. So the jury sees the full video of all, all those angles that at one point were one of the cuts so obviously those those videos exist, right? It's just cutting to a better end. So all those full videos are shown to the jury, as well as on bench, there is a, a video angle from the floor where um, there's like a camera on the floor that basically is a video of the bench, so you can see 
you can get a clearer angle of whether the lifters butts on the bench or not. Okay. So they did have plenty of angles and they could, they could take their time. to. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Julia, did you have anything else that you want to follow up with? Um, no, I mean, I think, um, I didn't really know, you know, what they were looking at. Um, I saw them, you know, or, or heard of them looking, looking extensively at these videos, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, you know, they're, sometimes with video replay, it's um, a little bit of like paralysis by analysis, or at least, you know, just overanalyzing things. Um, and powerlifting is, or we want it to be, you know, like a kind of action live sport. And yeah. I don't think that this is conducive to that. I mean, I think that you can, and I've done it too with my own videos and training, you know, like I'll film from an angle and something that I was sure was depth. And maybe I have it from another angle looking, you know, three inches below parallel look borderline. Mm -hmm. um, and I can do that all day where I go, you know, back and forth. And, you know, a lot of these lifters, because they're trying to lift the most weight possible and win, you know, they're going to cut a squat right where they have to. Um, you know, their, their elbows are going to be exactly at what they think is depth, you know, block out is going to be hard because it's a max effort deadlift. And I think if we overanalyze it too much, um, one, it just detracts, but you know, two, it's just, it's minutia. Like, um, it doesn't matter how many angles you have. Um, we trust these judges to do their jobs. Um, they go through extensive, extensive training. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I agree. It is, it is disrespectful and it just, it just doesn't, it just doesn't need to happen in this capacity. Yeah. I would say to add in my two cents on it, like Mike, we talked about this in the pregame shows. Um, it adds, it, it removes an element of strategy from the sport that I think is, has always been part of the gamesmanship of the sport is like how to make good protests, how to say something that will get them to listen to you. Like when you go over to the jury, you see sometimes someone come running out to go to the jury and they're just like, don't even come over here. Like we, cause you're not going to get anything from us. Right. And there's that whole little gamesmanship of like, like um, of working over the jury, you know? And it's like, kind of like, that's part of the fun of it. That's part of the sport of it. There's a strategy as to like how you can uh, watch other, your opponents lifts and have an, an extra assistant coach there to like keep your lifter like in, you know, whatever you need to be doing, keep maybe adding baby powder or chalking them up, whatever it is in the back while also having your coach watching other people's lifts and going across and making that appeal to the jury and stuff like this. It it's there's strategy and there's gamesmanship where it's like, you have to be skilled at the game in order to be good at it. And I think by just doing replay and, and looking at every single lift, they're taking away that, that, you know, fun part of the game, in my opinion. And so, yeah, that would be my other, my only two cents on, on otherwise agreeing with what you guys are saying. There's no question that people were talking about it. We saw all the stories being posted about it on Instagram. We saw all the memes, all the meme accounts were having a field day with it and all of this kind of stuff. So when we bring this up, like we're not trying to bring it up from a negative position of like trying to chastise the IPF. It's like, we, this stuff is out there. What we're saying, this is out there. People are talking about it. Other people, not as nice as us are out there making memes about the IPF because of this. Um, and so we're just saying that we're just bringing it up as a, as a talking point of like what people are going to continue to talk about after the world championships and possibly like what could be done about it as well. You know, I think if you look at the world, way the world championships unfolded, we saw a lot more of these controversial over jury overturn things happening in the early part of the championships and they didn't happen as much towards the end. Do you, was that your feeling, Mike? Um, I didn't really think about it that way, but it it did feel it did feel worse at the beginning. It might just be because it, yeah, by the end I was kind of expected. <laughs> I was kind of used to it, but it it definitely felt worse at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the way that it usually is, like with the IPF, especially like they're aware of what people are saying and what people are doing, and I think they try to make adjustments. You know, um, I was we were all giving feedback to whoever, you know, the people that we have access to about this issue. And I think that they definitely made some adjustments as it went along. And it didn't seem to be as big of a problem towards the end. Julie, were you going to add anything else? Yeah. I mean, I, I also just want to say in the spirit of, you know, not, not um, trying to sound like we're chastising the IPF because, 
you know, we're not. Um, this is this is you know a relatively small issue. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of refing judging whatever controversies in a lot of federations. Um, you know, I've had my fair share of them in USAPL. There's a lot of them in USPA. Um, it happens, but I think the the thing with the IPF is there's such a high standard um, that's been set, and there's such a high standard of worlds that um, for this to happen is kind of like a novel thing, um, and I think that it it worries a lot of people because you know when we look at worlds, we look at like that's the gold standard of judging when. Like you said, I mean, even earlier in the podcast, you know, like Austin Perkins put up this 825. Yeah, we'll do it at Worlds. Do it under the strictest judging, you know? So when we have something like this, it kind of shakes up that notion. And so I think that that's um, one of the reasons why this has been so talked about. Um, but yeah, I, go on. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, you got any final thoughts on this? Yeah, um, my thoughts are... Um, I understand that Gaston wants the IPF to be the strictest judging that exists. And while, whether I agree or not, I can understand that. And I don't have an issue with that. What makes this different is that every federation has judging issues. Every federation will have bad calls. My issue here is not with the calls. That Everyone would make a big deal. When there's a bad call, everybody will spend the next day on social media memeing it. Yeah. Guess what? The day happens, maybe another day. People ignore it. The bottom line is everyone knows there's bad calls in both directions. My issue here is with the principle of what they're trying to do. It's if they decide that they want to be stricter and they tell the judges, I wouldn't like it, but they tell the judges that if it's borderline, give it reds, which you shouldn't. Um, I wouldn't like it, but I'd understand it. I just, I don't understand it. I don't understand the approach you're taking. And Gaston, if you're watching this, or maybe I'll just clip this and send it to you, I think you're making a mistake here. Bench depth is not the reason why we're not in the Olympics. This is a bigger reason why we're not in the Olympics. I think this has to change. I think it's a really bad viewing experience to see lifts just get overturned randomly. Yeah, when the commentator's saying that's a good lift and Delaney's celebrating and walking off and then you don't find out till like a couple minutes later and they've already gone to break that it was overturned and then you come back and you're like, wait a minute, what happened? You're right, like that 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 does, if, if everything is kind of gearing towards Eurosport and the viewing audience at home and making it broadcast savvy production, this definitely is not that. Like, this is definitely not it. So, um, okay. Any other thoughts from that for you, Julia? No, nope, that's it for me. Okay, so moving on then to my selection for what I think people will be talking about over the next few months. And it's kind of just a tie-in of all the stuff, all the positive things that we've been talking about up to this point is the, just the overall growth of the sport and how it's becoming so much more popular. There's so much more media coverage. We're getting support behind the things that we're innovating, like doing these press conferences, these pregame shows. You know, now people in our federation are expecting that we're going to do that kind of stuff going forward. The Olympics YouTube channel streaming the power, the whole world championships. I mean, that was amazing to have a, a broadcast that was on an account that has like 9 million subscribers. I did the math and I added it up. If you add up all of the different sessions on there and you add up all the views that they had as of when we started this podcast, like <laughs> so many hours ago, um, it was 1.3 million. In fact, let's see, I got the number 1.35 million views. So, I mean, this, what are we talking? That has to be like the biggest, this has to be the most viewed powerlifting competition of all time in terms of like live stream views, which are basically always on YouTube. 1.35 million has to be the most ever. I know Sheffield was like 200, 250,000 or something like after like a week or two out or whatever. Maybe it's now gone to a point where it's higher, but I don't think it's at 1.35 million. And I don't think any other competitions had 1.35 million on. And then that doesn't even take into account the fact that it was shown on Eurosport, which has like millions of viewers in and of itself as well. So this is the most viewed world championships ever. We talked about it at the beginning. It was the most att well attended, the most competitive, had the most athletes, the most countries involved. And we see things like the world games. We see things like Sheffield happening. 
And I think just people coming away from Malta, I like, I heard Joey Flex on a, on another podcast. He's just like buzzing, like about the, the future of the sport. Like this is what we were all wanting for like the last, however long you've been involved in the sport, you want to see it grow like this and just like absolutely blow up. And now I feel like we're right on the cusp of this becoming like a huge mainstream sport where we're going to start bringing in mainstream sponsors like companies like Gatorade, Toyota, Amazon, you know, big real companies that are sponsor other major mainstream sports. Um, and then that in turn is just going to make more athletes come in because there's more money involved. There's more possibilities for economic opportunities. And as the sport, you know, levels up, we get more and more competition, all these battles become more deep and it just, all of this stuff starts to coalesce into something that's just truly amazing. And so I hope that uh, aside from some of the negative things that obviously get people talking the most, um, that one of the things that people will be talking about over the next few months is just the positive growth of the sport and where we're going in the sport, the positive direction that the sport is taking. What's your guys take? Go ahead, Mike. Julia's writing something down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, obviously I agree with everything you're saying. Um, I mean, the sport is clearly growing in the right direction. Uh, you said 1.35 million views on the Olympic channel. I mean, that's insane. That's insane. Um, in the past, like uh, these kind of meets are getting in the tens of thousands, like like a good a good viewership would be if an individual session got 10,000 viewers. Here we were having 10,000 concurrent at like all times. We were getting on some of the sessions, we were getting over 100,000 views on an individual session. And keep in mind, um, the US, which is the biggest individual country, obviously doesn't make up all the powerlifters, but of any individual country, it's the biggest. A lot of these, um, competitions were going on at times where like it was the middle of the night or not hours that were necessarily like um good for american lifters but everybody's watching it. you have american lifters you have global lifters uh the sport's growing we're getting more viewers we're getting more competitors the biggest world championships ever we're expanding into markets that that um obviously probably have people lifting but didn't necessarily have like a big presence on the international stage uh, we had like big team from like Japan, China, Chinese, uh, ta Taipei, all these, like, I mean, uh, Asia is a massive market. It's a huge market. Um, they're heavy in like Olympic weightlifting. Um, most of the, I don't know, I don't know enough to know if it's actually most of the champions in Olympic weightlifting, but a, a high percentage of them are Asian. Um, the countries, um, they already have tons of people lifting. And when I say lifting, I don't mean, lifting casually recreationally we have people that like they lift that is their job that is they do that all day they are in um they like live in like like training centers the same way you have for like olympic training centers and they do weightlifting and now some of that's carrying over to powerlifting we're expanding into all these markets um their presence is being shown on the international stage we're getting bigger open teams from all these other countries a lot of countries that maybe in the past have maybe sent a lifter or a couple lifters to Worlds are now sending closer to full teams. And then some of the countries that hadn't sent anyone previously are now sending partial teams. So uh, I don't know the exact number, but it might've been 49 countries were at this world, something like that, which is a very large number. And we're growing and um, we're gonna see, cause there's more countries in total will be represented when you look at like the regionals. Like when you look at like Euros and the Asian games and, uh, uh, North Americans, when you combine all those, we're going to end up like probably in like the 70s or 80s of countries that are sending teams internationally. So the sport's going in the right direction. Um, the media is going in the right direction. Participation is growing. Um, in general, just like SPD, like squat bench deadlift, are being done by people everywhere. Nowadays, in every commercial gym, you'll see most people doing some form of squat bench deadlift. And most of those people are not competing, have never competed. But mm -hmm. the more people doing it and the more exposure they see to the sport, the more competitors we will have at the local level, which means eventually the more competitive it'll be at the higher level, which just means the more viewers, the more eyes, the more money, the more incentive for top level lifters and the more incentive for people that are more on the fringe to choose powerlifting over a sport like weightlifting, over a sport like CrossFit, over a sport like Strongman. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near somebody choosing powerlifting over trying to make it to the NFL, but 
We don't need to do that. We just need to have it where people understand it, where it's a viable option for everyone and where that is their goal. Some people grow up and say, I want to be, I want to be Tom Brady. I want to be Michael Jordan. But we're getting to the point where we're having kids grow up and say, I want to be Russell Orty. I want to be Jesus Alvarez. I want to be uh, Leah Bavua. Like we're getting to that point. And the more we keep pushing in that direction, the better it is. So I think we're in the right direction and we're not, we're nowhere near there yet. We're yeah. making strides, but we have a long ways to go because uh, the ceiling is high. People, people are like undershooting. They think, oh, we just, we need this. We need that. Like we should be at the point soon. Like there's no reason why we can't get to the point where, where when, if you qualify for Worlds, all you got to do is tell the person in charge of your federation when you want them to book your flight. They should, they should get to the point where if you qualify, everything's taken care of. Your flight's taken care of. Your hotels are taken care of. Everything's taken care of. Like That should be the point. I don't know how long it'll take till we get to the point where if you're a world champion, that means that that could be your job. But at minimum, we should be at the point where if you qualify to compete with the best in the world, where everything is taken care of. So I think we're in, that, in the right direction there and we're on our way. Yeah, I mean, I know when I grow up, I want to be like Amanda Lawrence, right? Um, but um, yeah, I mean, definitely that's a goal of Power of Ten America. Mike Z and I have talked about that many times about like you you make it onto a world's team or an international team, any U.S. national team. And it's like your flights, your hotels, your track suit, your, your gear, all your Team USA swag and stuff. That's all going to be paid for by Power of Ten America, hopefully in the future. It's, we're not at that point yet, but that's where we want to get to for sure. Julia, what is, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, um, just to, to touch on what Mike said a little bit before I, I head into my main point here, um, you know, about um, Asia being a huge market and already having a huge footprint in other barbell iron sports, um, you know, uh, particularly weightlifting. Um, everyone's aware of it. I mean, King of the Lifts just posted, um, I'm not sure if you guys saw, but uh, I think I think she's 19. This Korean girl um, who squatted um, 595. Um, you know what if those people? You know, with with weightlifting's future in the Olympics kind of unsure at this point, um, due to how many um, sanctions they've gotten from people popping. Um, you know, with 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 their future unsure in the Olympics, what if those people came over to powerlifting? What if we saw? Um, you know, this girl who's 19 come over and challenge Bonica and um, Sunita and all of them squatting, you know, um, 600 pounds. I think that the numbers that we're seeing now, you know, while we think they're astronomical, um, we have so far to go if the talent pool gets bigger. Um, and I think that we're in a prime position to do that. Um, you know, when the USAPL split from the IPF in uh, 2021, a lot of people were really unsure and pessimistic about the future of powerlifting. I know I was pretty discouraged. I, I was like, I don't, I don't know how long I, you know, I'm going to stay in this sport. Maybe I'll try weightlifting, maybe, you know, something else like, you know, I'm getting old anyway, like all these young people are coming up. It's, this is just another, you know, we're, we're fractioning again. Um, there's already too many feds and now the tested side is fractioning. What, what does this mean? But, you know, two years on, um, I think two years on, um, now we're in a position that's completely different and we're in a position that I couldn't have imagined. Um, and like, I mean, Look at you know the world games going raw, uh, Eurosport getting on board, the Olympic Channel, Sheffield happening. Um, things can turn around fast, and um, I think that you know maybe something might seem unrealistic um, now looking at it. And this goes for you know our predictions with lifting too. Um, but we're biased a lot by what's happening in the moment, and we have no idea how big this sport can become. And I think that, you know, the growth recently is just a testament to that. Like we, the, the future was so uncertain and now it led to this. So um, I'm very hopeful for the future and um, 
you know, I think this is great. And I'm, I'm glad that the world's, you know, popped off the way it did. I think that powerlifting is really going to become a spectator sport now, which, you know, we never thought was possible. For sure. I mean, just talking about growth, I mean, we posted it on our Instagram just earlier today that um, on our little Power of the America account, we reached f- over 5 million accounts in the last 30 days. I mean, that just tells you like the, the popularity of powerlifting. People are consuming our reels and our videos and our posts. 5 million people have consumed them. 5 million people have seen it. Like that's just wild. That's wild numbers that we never would have thought. And I think Julia, this is why I brought this up as like, why I hope that people will be talking about this going forward is because like you said, it was, there was a time when things were looking dark and when things, when it was very pessimistic, I was very pessimistic and we didn't know there was a lot of uncertainty. Now I feel like the only uncertainty is around like how far we can push it. You know, like there's no question that it's uh, that we're on an upward trajectory and that the future is going to be bright. The question is just how bright, you know, like that's the only uncertainty that exists anymore. Um, and, and as far as the split and all of that kind of stuff, um, now I think like you start to see that we're going to see people in the next few months starting to come over to power in America, more, more high level athletes, more high level athletes are going to come out of the woodwork. Like the people that you're talking about, it's going to raise the level of competition, which is going to, in, in the end, make a more, make a better product that someone's going to want to watch. You know um, there's still a few weight classes. Like we, I just mentioned Amanda Lawrence or the 84s. There's, there's only, you know, Jesus in the, in the one twenty pluses. Other than that, there are no like runaway weight classes anymore. There are two left standing and they're going to probably fall, you know, as those lifters progress and as those lifters, you know, maybe age out of those classes. But I mean, someone's going to come up. Jesus in his own family has two more brothers that are, I just saw another one is like squatting. Um, So, I mean, someone's going to come and challenge even in those weight classes as the sport gets more and more popular. um, Every single weight class is going to be stacked. Doing things like podium, getting on the podium at Worlds is going to be like a massive massive feat just to get bronze and then you're going to check your box and get to go to the world games you know which is going to just be like the biggest stage of them all so i think it's really positive it's really amazing um uh, as i have to also give my hats off to you too you both both been a part of the innovative things that we've been doing you know with press conferences pregame shows these interviews that we do with the athletes um this podcast which is like a different podcast for a federation to have a podcast like this um just all the stuff that we do behind the scenes uh, that you two both do behind the scenes as well to help grow the sport hats off to you because there's just more and more people like us that are like-minded that are getting together and doing things. And hopefully, you know, if all of us put our heads together, we're going to make this thing really blow up. Uh, Mike, did you have something else you want to add? Um, I, I think you mostly covered everything, but um, I just like what you said about how it's not a matter of like, if we're growing, it's just how, how far can we grow? Like, I think we're at the point now where the people that are making the relevant decisions can no longer be trying to like, okay, let's make an improvement here. Let's make an improvement there. Like, let's see what people are saying on social media. We're at the point where like, we're go, we got to go for the gold. We have to like, we have to push ourselves to like standards that we didn't think were possible. We see like the lifters are already pushing themselves to standards that people never thought were possible. People now are doing things that like people are coming not top five now with numbers that would have won worlds a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, just the level of lifting has like increased significantly. The level of participation has increased significantly. All the way, all we can do now is just push the actual level of the growth of the sport. Like, like you said, we should have mainstream sponsors. We should. We reached. You said five million accounts. This month. Five million people saw reels and videos of either powerlifting, um, or or um, or some uh, whatever preview, whatever they call it, uh, press conferences. Yeah. Or there seems something to do with powerlifting. Just that means there's five million people out there who either have a specific interest in powerlifting or at least have enough common interest that that is getting shown to them. That means the people are out there. We have to start converting these people like into actual, whether it doesn't have to be, not all of them will ever compete, but we got to convert them into competitors. These people that are viewing it, like we should get to the point where one day it's normal to get not a million views on the world championships, 
in all a million views on a session. Like yeah. that's what we should be shooting for. We should be a million viewers viewers on a session. Like that 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 doesn't seem like something that nowadays is out of reach. Or let's say we got a hundred thousand views on some of the sessions. Why not a hundred thousand concurrent viewers? Is it impossible to have a hundred thousand viewers at a time? No. I mean we have we're at the point where we've got there's probably 20, 25 lifters in the sport who have over 100,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. Some of them way more. Like we have people who are not only are invested in lifting and in squat bench deadlift or in power and take extent, but invested in the actual personality of the sport. Exactly. So we're not only going to grow through some numbers that get hit, we're growing, we're growing through personalities that people can appreciate, that they can view as a fan, that they can like be engaged with and feel like they're a fan of the, of the individual not just the lifting, but the person themselves. I mean, we're going in the right direction, but we have to make sure that we're thinking big enough because we shouldn't be limiting ourselves. I mean, how has the America went from a tiny federation with basically no competitors, just a few at Twitch show who like, were legit like world champion threats, and we're growing, we're getting more members, we're getting people watching, following our Instagram, watching our videos, people that care. We, we need a... We need to focus on, as a whole, just completely pushing the sport to bounds that people don't know are possible. Exactly. I think you nailed something there where you're saying the athletes are doing it. The athletes are pushing beyond what we thought was possible. Everyone else involved in the sport also has to do that exact same thing. They have to go beyond what they thought was possible. They have to re-envision what they thought was possible in the past where everyone would say, no, you can't do this. You can't do that. We have to say, yes, we can do that. We can get into the Olympics. Yeah, we can get into the world game. We can have a hundred thousand people watching our, uh, our, our broadcasts all at once. You know, we can do pregame shows and postgame shows and press conferences and all this stuff. Um, and it's, and it's really just, I think it's a testament to like, I think the lifters, the athletes, they're the stars. And like you said, people are coming to see them. They're the superstars. It's our job as people that are in these uh, other roles is to lift them up as much as possible, like give them the biggest audience we possibly can, because that's our golden ticket is for someone to go and see Jesus squat a thousand pounds. They're going to be a fan of this, of watching the sport, not just because they lift, but like, like I, I never played really serious football outside of like peewee football. You know what I mean? So, but that doesn't mean I can't be a, a, a huge sport, a, a huge fan of football. You know, you don't have to play the sport. Once we get past that, we're just people that are fans of general sports in general, not of that. They're not lifters. They're not necessarily power lifters. And then they come in and they see Jesus and they start wearing like Jesus for president shirts. I mean, it's going to be amazing like that. So that's what we have to keep doing. Um, Julia, I saw you writing some stuff down. You, what, what else do you have to add? Yeah. So uh, it, it just goes along with this a little bit, you know, um, people have been talking about, um, you know, powerlifting not being something, you know, athletes can make a living off of and what can we do to um, elevate it to a professional level? What can we do to bring it out of the hobby sport realm? And, you know, USAPL tried and they did a good job and, and USPA and WRPF, the untested federations, they tried to, you know, making the pro series, making professional meets. Um, and those things kind of, um, you know, they kind of fell by the wayside a little bit, or, you know, maybe not in the case of USAPL, but it, it wasn't implemented as well as it could have been. I know the big money meets in WRPF and USPA have kind of like puttered out a little bit um, and aren't drawing as much attention. And I think that's because you have to make the case for a sport um, being professional caliber before it can become a professional sport. Yeah, and it just think, professional. Like it needs to actually look and behave like a professional sport before people recognize it, even if you put the pro label. Yeah, and I and I think that you know that's what we're seeing with the IPF and Powerlifting America. Um, we've now made the case. You know, maybe maybe they they didn't get as much payout um, at Worlds as they did at the Pro Series. I mean, I know they did at Sheffield. Um, you know, and that, that that's a little different because it's a, a private company sponsoring it. But we, I think we've made the case now that these athletes are captivating in their performances and they draw attention and they do deserve to be professional athletes. Um, 
And I think that that's the proper way to go about it because you can't really force uh, something to be, uh, you know, a professional sport and to be entertainment if it's not entertaining, if people aren't, you know, yeah. drawn to it. But now they are. Now they are. I think, um, you know, the IPF, SBD, Powerlifting America, we've all played our part in this. And I think that we're going about this the right way. And I think that this, this is the start of powerlifting being a professional sport. I yeah. think that's what we're seeing. A new era in powerlifting is upon us, right? We're in it. We're, we're in like the very first stage of the new era, I think, for sure. Uh, Mike, did you have anything else that you want to add? Uh, I think we covered everything. I mean, All right. I think just the IPF should honestly, they, they should be watching what Powerlifting America does and just trying to like emulate it because, I mean, we're just doing, you can't try to say, let's wait until we have a million viewers and then we'll start getting better production. Then we'll start focusing on the lifters. You have to do it when there's a hundred lifters, when there's a thousand lifters. You got to do it and put the pieces together. Be it like, like Julie was saying, be a professional sport, do all those things and let the sport grow. When I'm saying we weren't getting a million viewers watching the pregame or postgame press conferences, but guess what? The lifters that we're watching were commenting that they were very happy. The, the, the high level lifters that saw it appreciated it. They appreciated how they were being treated. They appreciated the fact that it was considered like, they were getting treated the way an athlete would. That's how you start. You do it and then you let the people come. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's a really good point is like, we, we're going to keep doing it and we're going to with Power to America. Like we started this Instagram account. I had like 2000 followers. I mean, also we mentioned that, um, you know, Power to America is not even two years old. I mean, it'll be two years old in like October. Um, so we, we're just getting started over here with what we're doing in Power in America. I think we look back on all this, including this podcast production quality, um, in like years, two, three years down the road, and we're going to just be laughing at how bad it is. <laughs> and Mike, with all of our technical problems that we had at Worlds with our pregame shows and all this, I mean, in the future, we'll have like real producers doing stuff, you know what I mean? Um, it'll just be amazing, but, but yeah, like it's about having that vision and just like plowing towards it and not letting anyone deter us from it and just watching the people come like, like there's that famous sports phrase. If you build it, they will come. Right. I mean, and like, that's what we're trying to do over here. So, um, all right. And Julie, did you have any other final things? Nope. Yeah. Nope. Just, uh, oh, I, I do have one final thing. Um, you know, none of this would have been possible without you. Um, and like you had a vision that to make the, these podcasts and to start these interviews and that's really taken off. So like, you know, thank you. Um, you're a huge part of, of all of this. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm excited. I'm excited for, for the future of the sport. For sure. Well, thank you for saying that. And, um, you know, really it's a team effort and thanks to everyone who contributes to it. Mike Z in particular, and, you know, like the people that did the clipping for us, Maddie and Luke and everyone that's contributed Sam Sakura, who's like too busy making business deals to be on this podcast anymore. But, um, uh, but yeah, everyone has contributed. It was a team effort and we couldn't do it without any, any one of the people that helps make this possible. So, all right, with that, let's go ahead and wrap this part one of the recap of the biggest and best world championships of all time. And we'll come back at you with part two uh, in the next few days. Thank you to everyone who listens. And with that, peace out.